Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our California 2022 annual event. And this is a business meeting, so I am going to call the meeting to order at 9.05 a.m. on Saturday, April 30th, 2022. And I'm Diane Owens, and I am your current uh, president of AUW California. And it is a pleasure for me to be here. And it's a pleasure for me to see all of you on the screen. I wish I could see your smiling faces in person, but uh, when we had to plan this event uh, I, almost a year ago, we weren't sure what COVID was go had in store for us. So we decided it was probably safer to have our meeting and uh, this is our annual convention too. So we decided to merge the two, the business meeting and the convention together in a virtual event. So, uh, so I hope you're happy about that. Uh, it's you know always good to be in person, but we can actually have more people if we have it virtually so that uh, there isn't an expense of hotels and, flights and things like that. So more people are able to join us. So I am going to uh, be your MC all day. And I am going to now talk a little bit about our agenda. I hope you've all downloaded it. And so you know, we have some wonderful speakers that are coming to inspire us today. So we have some keynote speakers, we have another kind of surprise speaker. So anyway, we're going to have some adventures today, and you're going to learn more about that later, but this is going to be fun. You're going to be flying through space into different rooms and have different uh, discussions. So that's really going to be fun. We're also going to hear three speech trek participants. The uh, top three in the state are going to speak to us today. And I have already seen some of them and they are so inspiring. So I know you're going to enjoy that. These young women are amazing, absolutely amazing. So we have a great program planned. I hope you'll be able to stay with us the whole day because you're gonna be happy if you do. So now I'm going to uh, introduce you a little bit to our board of directors. Uh, we have 11 elected board meeting, uh, 11 directors, and uh, they've been elected and they've been serving most of them for the past two years. So we have Sandy Gabe, who is our president-elect, Roly Wendorf, our CFO, Lynn Batchelor, our secretary, and also our AUW fund chair. And we have Carol Holscrap, who is the director in charge of branch assistance and membership. Kathy Harper, who is our co-chair of public policy. And we have Tracy Clark, who is a director in charge of communications. Michelle Miller Gallus, who is a director with our marketing team. And we have Elaine Johnson, who is a director and in charge of as co-chair with our DEI, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee and Crystal Stebbins, who is the director and also with marketing, and Sharon Siebert, who is a director with marketing. And we also have a leadership team, a complete, and this has been one of the things that I've enjoyed most since I've been president, is that the entire leadership team meets because it doesn't cost us anymore, and they are such great leaders. And so these are appointed positions but they are very important positions. So we have Janice Lee, who is the DEI co-chair. We have Dawn Johnson, who is our parliamentarian governance. And she's also the editor of that very clever California Connection. We have Sharma Gearing, who is our meetings planner. And also she is the head of our nominations and elections committee. We have Marlene Kane, who is our speech track program director, who you're going to hear from several times today. We have Sue Miller, who is our co-public policy chair. And we have Kathy Ford, who helps us invest our money 
so Yay. that we make money, not lose money. And we have Karen Manellas, who is our Tech Trek program director, and Susan Stecklar, who is our Tech Trek financial liaison. So anyway, this leadership team has been wonderful, and they've all been helping put this program together. And one of the things in our business meeting, which we're going to, we are going through now, is to tell you what we've done for the past year, actually the past two years. But, uh, and so Sandy Gabe has put together a wonderful rendition of our accomplishments in 2021 and 2022. So take it away, Sandy. <music>
Wasn't that great? That is so much fun. Thank you, Sandy, so much for the time you spent putting that all together. But as you can tell, we were very, very busy the past year and the past two years, actually. So uh, I now am going to uh, turn the meeting over to our first keynote speaker. And I'm going to introduce Sharman Gearing, who's going to introduce this woman who many of you already know and already love, Sharman. Good morning, everyone. I had the distinct pleasure to introduce to you one of my people in AEW. When I was on the national board, I was able to meet Lisa Matz when she was working at AEW. And I'm so thrilled she's here with us today. So I'll give you a little bit of her background. She's a nationally respected advocate in the progressive movement. Her nonprofit career began when she was named executive director of Turning Point, a domestic violence program recognized for excellence by the Ohio Supreme Court. Most recently, Lisa served as vice president of government relations and advocacy for AEW in Washington, DC. She's also held adjunct appointments with several universities and worked on Capitol Hill. After more than 20 years of advocacy efforts in our nation's capital, Lisa began a teaching and traveling sabbatical that included moving back home to Cleveland, Ohio. As she settled in at her lake house, she was hired by Ohio Citizen Action in 2020 as a senior advisor, where she works on consumer protections, environmental issues, and pro-democracy efforts in her home state. And Lisa is well loved by her faithful companion, Lefty, who might be joining us today. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much, Sharman. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, for being here. Really want to thank Diane and Sandy. This whole board putting this together, I have to say I've been very impressed uh, with how organized and how wonderful the technology is being used. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be here with you. Uh, thrilled to be amongst all these dangerously educated women. Uh, you just never know what we're going to cook up. Uh, but special thanks to my good friend Sharman uh, for helping me uh, uh, get involved. And uh, a special shout out, of course, always to Congresswoman Jackie Spears, uh, who I worked with for so many years on Capitol Hill. Really pleased to see you all giving her an award. Uh, so deserved, uh, truly a fearless leader. And I tell you what, the California delegation sends a lot of really great members to Congress. Uh, so when you have uh, someone like Jackie Spear, who uh, is such a standout, that's really saying something. So uh, again, uh, thrilled to be a part of the agenda with her. And of course, newly minted uh, CEO, Gloria Blackwell, who I worked with, uh, at AAUW, congratulations to her as well. So what am I gonna talk about this morning? There's so many things, so little time because you all are on this great adventure and I am so pleased to be part of it. A little bit of a, uh, you punch the ticket for this part of your itinerary. I wanna talk about doing advocacy in challenging times. Y'all feel that for a second, you know exactly what I'm talking about. How do we do advocacy in challenging times? Because look at that uh, video we just saw about your board and the great work that they're doing. Public policy is still California AAUW's middle name and always will be. And you've got several things throughout the day where you're gonna hear from your public policy folks, you know, the wonderful Cappy, Cappy Harper and Sue Miller, uh, who I worked with for so long. You've got a stellar crew and you've got a state that is in many ways on top of these issues, uh, the issues that we care about in terms of women, in terms of equity, uh, in terms of intersectionality uh, and making sure that we lift all boats uh, and so on. Unfortunately, of course, for a lot of us, we don't live in a state like you do. Uh, moving back to Ohio, I feel like I uh, landed right in a dumpster fire, quite frankly. Uh, redistricting mess, huge bribery scandal where they bought the speaker of the house and got a horrible climate bill through, handouts to corporate corporations, uh, really pretty much all the nasty stuff you'd imagine. And one of the things I got to tell you that is inspiring for those of us uh, outside California is to see the good work that California has done. And I know I've talked about this before, but I can't underscore it enough. You all doing your work in California is huge because you continue to blaze a path 
you continue to show other states how it's done, what can be done, that the world doesn't fall apart, for instance, if you do paid sick days, that the world doesn't fall apart when you pay attention to equity issues. So all of these things in terms of the issues that we care about, equal pay and Title IX and so on, you all in many respects are leading the charge. Obviously, when it comes to reproductive rights, uh, you also are leading the charge. And in fact, the state is kind of preparing to be a destination for women who need assistance. Uh, we are gonna see that. We know this decision is coming down in, in June, uh, pretty much something that is gonna be pretty ugly for those of us who care about not just reproductive rights uh, when it comes to abortion, but birth control. Uh, you know, we have a ridiculous bill here in Ohio where they think that somehow you can remove uh, an embryo from an ectopic, pre an ectopic, ectopic pregnancy and somehow replant it in, in the uterus. It's ridiculous. Uh, they all need a 101 lesson on how reproduction works, quite frankly. Uh, so again, the way that California leads the way, the way that you hold people accountable the way that you keep electing good folks that go to, to DC and fight the fight is huge. So your federal stuff your state uh, and your state stuff are imp important and we appreciate that work. But how to keep doing this advocacy? I'm gonna tell you there's a couple of things that really make a difference. Um, one of the things that is really hard to avoid, and I know that you all have experienced this in California, is to avoid what I like to call the crab fight. And crab, yes, those tasty crabs that you can eat, but there is that old analogy, if you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket, they will fight each other to the death. And the reality is in the progressive community, while we're all trying to be inclusive and helpful, uh, if we fight each other, nobody wins. Uh, and so there needs to be and continue to be planning where groups work together. So one of the things your board did that was so smart was looking for coalition opportunities, looking for ways to work with other groups, not only to amplify AAUW California's voice, but also to make sure that we were presenting a united front in terms of what we wanted to see in California. That's huge. But the other piece that I'm going to tell you applies not just in state and federal politics, but it also in the work that you do on a personal level. And that is all about the narrative. What's your story? In these challenging times when people are so identified with red or blue, with Biden or Trump, it's very hard to break through, to have that reasonable discourse that AAUW California uh, and AUW mem members generally have always valued so highly. And I can imagine the frustration. You know, for me, I've always seen myself, uh, and when I worked with AUW, felt it very deeply about being bipartisan. Uh, looking for that compromise, working across the aisle. And in recent years have found myself at least initially thinking, I'm getting more partisan, right? As I've, as I've lost my red hair and let it go white and, and natural here, I feel like the partisanship has bled in too. Uh, and then I really started thinking about it. And I realized that I wasn't necessarily more partisan. It was a system that shifted around me, not my views, not my goals, uh, not the issues that I care about, uh, not the issues that we collectively care about as part of the AAUW mission. Like so many things where we have been trailblazers. Remember, we had a, a, a resolution in favor of birth control a hundred years ago, you know, I mean, uh, we have always been at the forefront and not shy about it. Uh, and we need to continue to do that, to be proud of it, to speak truth to power 
uh, but to do it with a story. Uh, you know, we have oftentimes really relied on our research and our research is still, is still key, right? I mean, we love the facts and for a long time, it really worked. We could convince people based on the data. The hard data would tell us what the truth was, which would illuminate what policy solutions we needed to come up with. And that's still hugely important. But we need to have a personal story so that, that goes on. with it to help people understand how this really touches us on a daily basis, to get away from things that unfortunately right now people find suspicious, like data and science, and talk about personal stories, because that's the place where we can still relate. So I don't think it does how does this impact us community. personally? How does this become uh, uh, an issue that plays out in my life, that plays out in your life? Uh, because you're not looking for sympathy, you're not looking for, for pity, but people can still empathize. Uh, we're not as good at it as we used to be, but you can still empathize. So as you do your advocacy and you're thinking about strategy and you're doing, say, the one minute active activist, which is a great development, uh, as you continue to engage, remember and think about what's my narrative? What's my story? Why is this so important? Because those personal stories are going to be what connects us in a time when connections have become so difficult and so fraught with red or blue, liberal or, or conservative, not even liberal or conservative anymore. It's even beyond that, right? Right wing, ultra right wing. So I put that out there to you to think about it. Now, when you think about that narrative and to avoid that bucket of crabs where we fight each other, one of the things <clears throat> that I have found in my work in Ohio, and that I think is something that the progressive community has found nationally, is that the pro-democracy efforts are something that can really unite people. The, you know, the, 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 the pride and the citizen right to vote, the ability to redistrict in a way that is fair and authentic for communities. And one development inside of all this chaos, inside of all this craziness that has also finally happened is that I feel like the entire progressive community for the most part and for the first time finally gets the whole issue of reproductive rights. Now, I was just talking to AUW Indiana earlier today, and I was looking at some of the, the veteran activists in the room in particular, because I'm just gonna own it. You all told us, you told us, you said this right is always gonna be threatened. We can't rest on our laurels. Uh, you remember a time or your mom remembered a time when we didn't have not just right to abortion, but birth control, appropriate uh, women's health care. And you told us. And some of us listened and kept fighting like hell. But others within the progressive establishment were complacent. They relied on precedent. They said, oh no, that's, that's settled law. No matter all the different states that had different things creeping up uh, to, to chisel away, to take a bite away from these rights. The thought was it's settled law, it's not gonna matter. It matters, but that it, it's not gonna happen. And here we are faced in a situation in June where they are very likely going to remove Roe. Now, I'm going to tell you that Chief Justice John Roberts is going to try to couch it in a way that looks like they're not actually 
overturning Roe. They're going to try to count, couch it in a way that, you know, has some smoke and mirrors to show that they showed precedent. But when the rubber meets the road and we see how it works in states like Ohio and states like Mississippi, which is the case in question, and states like Texas, we're going to see that it really is then sending this issue back to the states. It's going to be pre-1973. And folks in California, in many respects, obviously, your particular rights will be preserved. But what you will find are friends and family in other states where those rights are immediately taken away. 26 states have what we call trigger laws. And the trigger laws essentially overturn Roe and make abortion illegal as soon as the Supreme Court does. So they don't even have to wait to pass something after the Supreme Court acts. They've already got it in place. So again, the narratives. What's the story here? Why is this important? How is this personal? And I'm not even saying that you have, if you've ever had an abortion, you need to out yourself. That's not even it. You're talking about why these fundamental decisions are important and the state and the, and the, the federal government should not be involved. It's a fundamental precept for AUW and the issues that we care about for women. When you think about the work that we do, think about all the folks that have benefited from AUW fellowships and grants. Underpinning that was their ability to plan their reproductive life. I think about all the work throughout history, 50 years of Title IX, my friends, 50 years. All of that predicated on being able to control our reproductive lives. So I put that out there to think about, always think about your narrative. Leading with the facts does not work in this day and age. It may be what motivates you, but it's not gonna be what motivates them. The other thing I wanna throw out there, cause I've got about five minutes left and I wanna keep make sure that we keep punching tickets and you keep going on to the next uh, part of your journey here. You got lots of good things to do today and breakout sessions is when you think about avoiding that bucket of crabs, thinking about your personal story and making sure that you have a sense of what's in it for you and, and can share it in a way that is moving to folks, is I also challenge AEW California members to think collectively as a state as well as as branches, not only about how you hold your local state and federal folks accountable to, to your values, to the mission that we care about, but ways that you might also work with AUWs in other states. There are things that we can learn, things that we can share, ways that we can inspire each other, particularly for states that are having a harder time, that are facing so much more of an uphill battle. That's one of the great things about AUW. You always get this sense about being in it together, right? Uh, that like-minded women coming together and figuring it out. It, you know, we know that one person can change the world. It happens all the time. At the same time, we know it's much more fun to do it in groups. And I encourage you all to do that. I encourage you all to think about ways Many of you are transplants. Many of you have been part of AUWs in other states. Many of you have lots of friends across the AUW network. And this is the time to reach out, to exploit them, to, to use them and network and talk about ways that we can work together. That's part of what also gets us through this. It isn't just about how we win. It's how we make sure that we're gonna be in one piece on the other side when we do win because the pendulum always swings. Keep that in mind, the pendulum always swings back and forth. And we as a nation and those of us in tougher states 
are actually, you know, obviously dealing with that in a more severe way. But California has to deal with that too, as you well know. And I hate to say it, but you also have the role of inspiring the rest of us as to what could be, how it can work when our values are focused and we pay attention to what really is important to us. So with that, I have one last thing here because I have a little person down here who wants to say hello. Everybody, Lefty McGee. Follow me on Facebook, talk to me on Twitter. If you need a speaker for your branch or your inner branch, let me know. I'm here to help. Thanks everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lisa. You are so inspirational. I wanna go out and save the world now, right? <laughs> and I can't do it by myself, but anyway. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's, it was our pleasure and our honor that you took the time to talk to us. Thank you very, very much. My pleasure. Thank Stay you. tough, ladies. Stay okay. tough. I, I hope you can hear us clapping. Right, right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to move on to the legislative overview, uh, which is very appropriate after Lisa's speech. Um, and I'd like to introduce our co-chairs, Kathy Harper and Sue Miller. So take it away, Kathy and Sue. Thank you so much, Diane, and welcome to everyone. And I wanna add my thanks to Diane's, uh, to Lisa Matz for joining us and uh, starting us off with such an inspiring presentation. Uh, Lisa, if you're still on, I just wanna say we miss you. We miss your clarity and your enthusiasm and the love that you have for women and the work that we do. And thank you so much for your recognition of the work that we do here in California through our public policy team and our public policy efforts. Um, I just one uh, comment that might be of interest to all of our members, Lisa talked about the importance of sharing and being part of the national community. Uh, if you didn't know, every the second Wednesday of every month, uh, Sue and I sit in on a call with national public policy team and all of the public policy chairs of every state throughout the nation. So we are talking and Sue and I are always moved by the fact of how far ahead we are of all of the other states and all of the things that they are still faced with and still struggling with that we have in many ways managed to overcome here in uh, California. All right, so we've got a lot to talk about. And uh, the first thing that I'm going to talk about, again, just right coming right off of Lisa's uh, presentation is that, you know, we don't do this work alone. It's not just Sue and I, it's not even just the 10 members of our public policy team. Um, but it takes all of us. And that's what Lobby Day and Lobby Week this year is all about. It's engaging all of our members and having you all join us to do our advocacy work and getting out there and talking to our uh, legislators in Sacramento. And it makes such a difference because we're able to reach so many more people through your efforts. So I just wanna give a huge shout out to all of you who participated with us this year. And thank you so, so much for your efforts. Um, and thank you all for doing your surveys. Those are so important to me. And I love seeing the comments that come back and, and the enthusiasm that you all share with us of, of your great visits and how, uh, how uh, what a great impression we were able to make upon the legislators. So I just wanna give you all a little bit of a wrap up here. Um, here's what we did this year. We had 37 teams. We had 116 members of uh, AUW California from 47 branches participating with, this, with us this year. And through your efforts, we were able to talk with either legislators or staff from 43 uh, different offices. That was down just a little bit this year. From last year, we had 59 offices that we were able to visit. And um, so we're gonna be talking more uh, within our team about what 
uh, the reasons for that might be and how we might make some changes for next year. But all in all, we felt that it was a really uh, good week and that um, we, we were able to do a lot of good work with our getting our bills out there in front of our legislators. And what we also found out through your surveys was that we have a lot of support out there for our top three legislative priorities. So again, thank you so much. And speaking of those priorities, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Sue Miller, who is going to then introduce our advocate, Kathy Van Austin, who will then, in her turn, uh, talk to you more about our bills. So take it away, Sue. Thank you, Kathy. You can all see on the next slide, which is coming up early, that our legislative advocate has had great experience. She's worked with a legislator in one of the very highest positions in the legislature. And then after a number of years there, she moved into the role of a lobbyist where she's gained extensive experience in effectively representing clients, many who are in nonprofit organizations. Kathy's a people person. She's gained the respect of legislators and their staffs, and they're willing to listen when she calls. She is raising the visibility of AEUW in the legislature. She not only knows all the ins and outs of getting bills passed, she's an excellent strategist, knowing the right time to put forward AEUW California's position on bills. We are very fortunate to have Kathy Van Austin as our legislative advocate. Kathy, please update us on our high priority bills. I'm happy to um, make sure. Well, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to join you for your annual meeting. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, just wanna give you a brief update on uh, where we're at with uh, some of our sponsored bills. Um, so what I'd like to do is start with um, just where we are in the legislative process. Uh, we are in the second year of a two-year session. All sessions last two years. Um, so this time of year, uh, we have uh, policy deadlines late April, um, early May. Um, so not only, we, only do we have the bills that were introduced in January and February of this year, but we also have bills left over from last year. Um, so it gets quite intense. And we are heading into, uh, within the next couple of weeks, uh, a lot of bills will be heard in fiscal committee, then they're gonna go to their floors and then uh, pass over to the other house, so assembly bills to Senate and, and vice versa. Um, by the end of May. <clears throat> At the same time, we're, we're working on budget, um, and uh, we do have, as a co-sponsor of AB92, we do have a significant budget ask in. Um, we're feeling a little better about it, and so I will, I'll, I'll jump into that right now. Um, so our first bill, we co-sponsored last year, so it's a two-year bill. Um, it has moved through the assembly, it's over in the Senate, it's gotten through the policy committee, and it's sitting in the appropriations committee in the Senate, and we are holding that bill there. Um, our activity on this issue, um, and let me just give you a brief ex explanation of what the bill does, it, it waives family fees. Um, we hope to amend it to waive family fees through September 30th of 2024. That's the maximum allowed under federal law that was passed late last year. And so we, last year, were very successful. Uh, we were able to get about $85 million in the state budget to pay for family fees, which, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, are required uh, it, for families who are using the state subsidized child care program. And through COVID, uh, there, you know, People lose jobs, um, they have to stay home, they can't, um, if they can't pay for childcare, they either lose their jobs. I mean, there's a whole myriad of, of things that can happen. And so what, what waiving family fees does is 
they don't have to pay their their provider, their child care provider. Um, the state pays that uh, with a combination of state and federal funds. And by doing that, you're immediately putting money in the July 1 of 2021, uh, yes, 2021, families didn't have to pay the fees. They were able to use that money for, to pay rent, to pay past due bills. Um, I've n met a number of women who were able to st stay in their apartments. Um, some were able to say, okay, well, you know, I've got childcare, I've got a little bit of extra money. I'm going to school. I'm going to I'm going to improve my situation. So there's a whole bunch of things that can happen um, that really help these families who need it most. So this year we're again asking for um, two years of additional uh, family fee waivers. And um, thus far, we, I think, have been successful in getting to one year. We're trying to push for that second year, uh, which is allowable. And then once we know what happens in the budget, which has to be to the governor by June 15th. Uh, so we'll know by then uh, what we'll have in the budget and we will know um, how to amend AB 92. Um, one of the things we are going to do is make sure that it does conform to the federal statute that was just passed. So there's still a huge role for AB 92. And of course, we are working diligently on um, that budget request to get to get additional funding. So that's AB 92. Uh, that's the co first co-sponsored bill that I worked on for AAUW California. Um, another bill that we're co-sponsoring this year is AB 1666. And um, to uh, uh, Lisa's points that were made earlier, what this bill does is for those states that um, are going to put in very stringent, like a Texas law or even a Missouri law, uh, as she mentioned, 26 states, which is amazing to me, 26 states are ready to go uh, to ban um, or severely restrict um, uh, the right to abortion. Um, AB 1666 will protect women who are coming to California, women who are help, helping women or men who are helping them get to California, um, providers who are providing the services or assist in providing services, and frankly, um, anybody who con con uh, contributes to service, Planned Parenthood or uh, maybe perhaps a clinic that does uh, provides these services, Technically, they could potentially be sued. So what AB 1666 does is it provides civil protections for this group of people um, to ensure that even if their other state uh, has an anti-abortion law, that they cannot be sued uh, for reproductive services that are provided in California. It protects the women, it protects the providers, um, it is uh, com a little bit complex because we have, uh, you know, a state-to-state -state agreement. It's called um, the Full Faith and Credit Act. Um, our constitutional attorneys are working through that, but so far the bill has been very well received. It's on the assembly floor. Uh, AAUW, California, uh, we've had our letter uh, into the assembly uh, members, all of them, and uh, we're we're very, very confident that we will have the votes. Um, it will be taken up, as I understand, this path, this next week, this coming week. So that'll be exciting to get that over to the Senate. Um, the other thing that we have, uh, the other bill that we have this year that's a priority is AB 1968. Um, that bill would require continuity uh, amongst all of the public higher education institutions, actually CSU and UC, um, to make sure that there is a, a model template um, for their websites, for the school websites that provide information, resources, uh, a, an explanation of what should happen, what a woman should do if she has suffered a, a sexual assault. Um, right now, it's very inconsistent. 
some schools have uh, a stronger presence in terms of assisting women. Um, many do not, and so this bill will provide that consistency and really um, raise the bar on the type of information that is provided uh, for women and so that they know exactly what to do and who to reach out to. So that bill has passed the assembly. Um, it's moving very comfortably. Uh, I don't think it's had a no vote. And uh, that is waiting in Rules Committee over in the Senate. Uh, Rules Committee is the committee that refers all bills to uh, policy committees. So we're expecting that to be referred fairly soon. So those are our th top three pi priorities. We have a number of bills that we are supporting this year. Uh, I think we're at about 32, um, but uh, we have a number of bills relating to higher ed, uh, to pay equity, to obviously women's reproductive health. There are a number of bills this year um, on, on women's rights and uh, right to privacy and so forth. Um, so what I can tell you is I absolutely love representing AAUW California. I have to tell you, uh, the issues that you are dedicated to um, make it very easy for me um, to, to talk with legislators. Um, I, I really share your val values, and I am so pleased to represent you. And the nice thing that we're seeing now is that legislative offices, they're starting to reach out to us for information. Um, so, you know, my, my goal is to continue to raise your presence, make sure that your voices are heard, and uh, really work hard to get these import, important policies passed um, to protect women and those supporting women uh, through some tough times. It's a, it's a scary time right now. So I appreciate the opportunity to share with you and um, I'm always happy to answer questions, and uh, you can reach me if you can reach out to Kathy uh, and or Sue um, first. They will pass your notes along to me, and I, I'm more than happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Diane, are you going to come on or you want me just to? We did, as you can see, we have we have our, our three B bills up here, but in the interest of time, Kathy is sticking right to her, her time assignment. And so uh, we won't go through these, but you will have access to the, uh, uh, to the whole presentation. So you can take a look at, we have our three, what we call B bills up here. Those are our also priority, but not quite as high priority as the, as the three that, that Kathy went through. So we'll just go ahead and skip through those. If we could have the next slide. All right, it is, we've come to that time that is just always so exciting for me. Um, this is the uh, second year that we, had the opportunity to present our Equity Champion Award. Last year was the first year and we presented it to uh, State Senator, California State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson. And this award goes to a uh, female legislator at either the state or uh, national level who has uh, demonstrated a commitment to advancing legislation uh, in the interests of uh, 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 bettering life for women and girls consistent with our mission. So uh, I'm going to, in a moment, introduce you to this year's equity champion. And I just want to uh, share with you a little bit about her background and you, uh, help you understand why she has been selected by the Public Policy Committee as our equity champion for this year. Uh, she has a, uh, an extensive elective uh, background going all the way back to uh, starting in 1980. Uh, she is a California uh, Congresswoman representing the 14th Congressional District, which stretches through South San Francisco and San Mateo County. She started out on the San Mateo Board of Supervisors, went on to the California State Assembly, and then to the California State Senate before being elected to Congress. Next slide, please. 
And uh, she has a long history of being a legislative champion of women's rights. Uh, if you recall back around 2017, you might have heard about the Me Too movement. And uh, Congresswoman Spear is uh, to be credited with uh, advancing that movement and uh, uh, introducing the Me Too Congress Act, which requires mandatory uh, anti-harassment training. Uh, provides that survivors are no longer required to undergo mandatory counseling. Interns and fellows have the same protections as permanent staff. And violating members must cover their own expenses, not taxpayers. It was a huge, uh, huge uh, win in 2017. Throughout her career, she has continued to advocate for fundamental reforms to end sexual assault in the military and on college campuses. She's been at the forefront of efforts to obtain ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. She has advocated for passage of the Pink Tax Repeal Act. And in 1996, here in California, she was integral to the passage of California's Gender Tax Repeal Act. One other thing that is not on your screen that you might be interested in knowing and maybe have did not know or not aware of, Congresswoman Spear is also a member of AUW. She joined the North Peninsula branch in 1980 and in 1989 was the recipient of their named gift honoree. It is with great pride in a, in a, in a California girl and um, joy that we present this uh, uh, equity champion of 2022 to Congresswoman Jackie Spear. Thank you so much. Um, I believe you can hear me and see me now. Uh, thank you, Kefli. You've sort of taken um, everything I was gonna talk about and done it in a very swift way. So um, that's, that's good to know. I'm honored to uh, be the second recipient. I was with Hannah Beth uh, just a few months ago in Santa Barbara, and uh, you couldn't have picked a, a better, stronger advocate for women as your first recipient than Hannah. Um, as Kathy said, I've been a member of AEUW for 40 years, and I was thrilled every time I introduced a bill in the state legislature that AEUW California was either the sponsor or was a supporter of it. So um, really a, a great honor to Lisa Match. You know why she is the star that she is. Um, we need her voice throughout the country. And uh, it was just uh, inspiring to hear her uh, speak this morning. Your theme today is adventure. And it reminds me of the Helen Keller quote, life is an adventure or it is nothing. So I embrace that in part because of my life experience. And it is in fact, the way we have to look at all of these things hitting us as women in this country today. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt also um, once said, you must do what you think you cannot do. And I guess that's my message to you and to me. We have to do what we think we cannot do. Uh, I have been trying to get the ERA passed uh, for decades, as have you. We've been doing this for 99 years. It started with Alice Paul in 1923. And it really should take us back in time to the suffragist movement because uh, for 70 years, women tried to get the right to vote in this country. Susan B. Anthony died before she ever uh, was able to achieve that goal. And women were marching every single day in Washington, DC in an effort to get it passed. They chained themselves to the fence at the White House, the first time it had ever been done. And then they were arrested and 35 of them were beaten. Um, they were sexually assaulted. Um, they were uh, given horrible food. They went on uh, hunger strikes, all because they wanted to make sure that women got the right to vote. Well, I think we've got to kind of take that persona and make it our own as we try to get the ERA pass. Um, 99 years we've been doing this. Uh, there are 193 countries in this world, 165 of them have an ERA in their constitution. The United States does not. Every written constitution in this country, excuse me, every written constitution in the world 
has it in their constitution except for us. And every written constitution since World War II has it in their constitution. So shame on us that we haven't done it. For those that somehow think the 14th Amendment covers it, it doesn't. And if we're basing it on precedent, uh, 14th Amendment was overturning the Dred Scott decision. It was about race. It wasn't about sex. And the standard for race discrimination is much higher than the standard for sex discrimination. Justice Scalia, the late Justice Scalia, once was asked the question if the Constitution required discrimination based on sex. And he said, well, no. But if the question is, does the Constitution prohibit discrimination based on sex? The answer is also no. So the discrimination is baked into our laws. And I'll just give you two examples. Tracy Rex wrote, went to work for the Department of Education in the state of Arizona. She got hired. At the same time, a colleague got hired, same job description, except that he made $17,000 more a year. And she went to court. And in court, the Department of Education in Arizona says, well, we base our salaries on what your salary history is. And the court found that that was okay. So again, baked in discrimination. Peggy Young was a employee at UPS for 10 years. And lo and behold, she gets pregnant. She tells her supervisor and her supervisor says, well, you've got to find out what kind of accommodations you need. She comes back, she says, I just can't lift more than 25 pounds. And her supervisor said, well, wait a minute, that's a huge liability for us. You're going to have to take an unpaid leave of absence. And by the way, lose your health insurance while you're pregnant. That all happened to her. She then filed a lawsuit, went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in the end, it was remanded. But the, in, the, the summary of it was that while UPS did discriminate, they didn't, you have to show that they intended to discriminate. And the reason they discriminated was because in depositions and in discovery, they found out that men at UPS who had diabetes or heart disease um, were accommodated and not had to lift more than 25 pounds, but Peggy Young was not accommodated. So those are the kinds of cases, bad cases that um, enter into the record and into precedent in this country because we don't have an ERA in our constitution. So I implore you, um, as I retire from uh, Congress, I implore you to stay with us in this battle to get the ERA into the constitution. Um, 38 states have now ratified it. There was a poison pill put into the amendment when it passed the Congress, putting a term limit. They then extended the term limit. Uh, my bill would just strike the term limit. And there's nothing in Article 5 of the Constitution that says that you can put li limitations into the amendments. So why was there an, a, a limitation put into this amendment? It was put in it by the chairman of the Judiciary Committee who didn't like the bill and only took it up because it was going to be discharged from his committee um, by votes that um, were going to be taken. And so he put this poison pill into the legislation. Um, the irony was that year, he had been in Congress for 50 years, that year he was defeated in a Democratic primary by a very young Elizabeth Holtzman. So um, that's why we've been dealing with this all this time. Uh, it should be certified by the archivist. And if this resolution passes the Senate, it has already passed the House, um, it will become the law of the land. Um, as I think about uh, all the issues that you've helped me on, whether it's um, finally after 10 years getting a military sexual assault out of the chain of command uh, in the military, uh, the Me Too Congress Act, um, and um, our work on uh, making sure that women and men in college settings are, are not sexually assaulted. Um, a good story there, even though we're dealing with a DeVos uh, effort to turn Title IX on its head, I was able in the reauthorization of VAWA to get um, part of my bill into the reauthorization. So now in this country, all universities and colleges that receive any kind of federal funds, so typically it's all of them because they have uh, students who are on federal loans, 
are going to have to do what are called climate surveys. They do them in the military. It's a way of determining, you create a baseline of what kind of uh, issues you have around sexual assault, and then you could track it every year. Um, so that is a, a good step in the right direction. Uh, beyond the, that, um, a feminist foreign policy resolution I've introduced. Uh, there are our Nordic um, brothers and sisters have actually embraced that. It's changed the way they look at foreign policy. And then of course the Pink Tax Repeal Act. When you go to the local pharmacy, um, buy men's razors, buy men's probiotics, buy men's diapers, uh, because you're paying more when you buy anything that's pink or designated for women. So we're gonna try and get that passed this year as well. Um, let me just say that it's a great honor to be with you. And I hope that, um, hold on, someone's trying to call me. Um, so as, um, as I complete my, my years in public service, I'm 40 now, I, I wanna thank AUW for always standing with me. Uh, whenever we were in the foxhole together, I knew we were going to achieve success. Um, so my party words are one of my favorite uh, quotations, um, and it's anonymous, but it, it reads, life should not be a journey to the end with the uh, interest in arriving in a well-preserved body, but totally used up, totally worn out, martini in one hand, chocolate in the other, screaming, woohoo, what a ride. Thank you all. Wow. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for sharing with us your story. And I have an idea that you're, you might be retiring from Congress, but I don't think you're retiring really. So I hope we see you often. So come back and visit with us. Thank I you. I would look forward to doing that. Thank you. Thank you. That was very inspiring. Thank you very much. Wow, so we've had a lot of inspiration this morning. I guess maybe we're all ready to save the world now, aren't we? Right, so now we're on to our adventure. And so I'm going to introduce our one of our adventure leaders, Dawn Johnson. And I mentioned before that she is the uh, parliamentarian and also the head of the governance committee. And she's also the editor of California Connection. So Dawn, let us know what is in store for us this morning. All right, Diane, thank you. Well, there's a couple of tough acts to follow. Um, so uh, our theme, or I should say Diane's theme for last year was be bold, be brave, be brilliant. So we are planning on being bold and brave and if we're lucky, it will turn out to be brilliant. So today, instead of the usual workshops in a dark room with a lousy screen, we have planned a series of breakout rooms for you and they are intended to be very short, informal, unstructured opportunities to talk and discuss about all sorts of things that we're interested in. Um, so we asked your fellow members, we asked all of you, what topics you thought you might want to talk about. And we were successful in recruiting 18 trail guides, we are calling them, who have volunteered to host a session on a topic that they thought was interesting and yet you might be interested in, in talking about. So we should point out that these incredible volunteer trail guides are not experts in these topics. They're not going to have a slideshow. They're not going to give you an agenda and you don't have to take notes. They are just there to facilitate your conversations about the topics that they think you might find interesting. And we are calling these topics our ports of call on our Adventureland tour. And you can see the list here on the screen you will be able to pick your topic and we will be having them twice during today's session, once coming up soon this morning and once later on in the afternoon um, after lunch. So you will be able to move back and forth between sessions. 
you will be able to hop in and out. You will be able to pick whichever you'd like to go to at any time during the adventure session periods. And we will, um, we will explain to you shortly actually how to do that. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll tell you how to board your boat because I know whipping around between breakout rooms is not something we do comfortably all the time. Uh, so Sandy will teach us how to do that later. Now, um, when we open the rooms, you may notice that a few of the rooms that we have listed here on today's ports of call slide may not be operating because there were last minute plane cancellations as there always is on a journey. So a couple of the rooms will not be available. You'll see those when we actually open the rooms. So you can't really start a journey without having a little bit of fanfare. Uh, I was going to ask all of you to smack a bottle of champagne against your laptop screen, but it's probably not a great idea. So instead, we are going to give you a little taste of the upcoming adventures in each of these sessions, because we have asked each of these hosts to prepare a 20 second commercial and that is a shameless attempt to get you to visit their room and talk about their topic so that they don't have to look at a blank Zoom screen for 30 minutes. They really wanna see a Zoom screen that's filled with all the little Brady Bunch family pictures. So you're going to hear from 18 of our um, hosts in the next in their commercials coming up. And we encourage you to jot down a note or two about what session sounds the most interesting to you and you'd like to attend once we give you the instructions, which will be coming up shortly. So with that, we're gonna take it away with our first commercial and we're going to whip through these commercials. And our first commercial will be actually a video. And this will be on the topic of life lessons learned by Lisa Barnes. Yes. Hi, Lisa here for life lessons for our daughters and sons. For example, I've learned if I have a really hard decision to make, if I just keep gathering facts, often the answer will reveal itself. And our next commercial is for Fantasies of Equity, hosted by Kathy Harper. The Public Policy Committee hopes you will join us in room two, AKA Fantasyland, where we'll explore the question, what does the future oops, what does the future look like for women and girls in your wildest fantasies? Will we ever achieve equity? What's in your crystal ball? Thank you. And next commercial is for don't lean in or huddle. Okay. Just be nice with Heather Zeng. Yeah, thank you. We're calling this the love bow. It's time to be kind. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected women more profoundly uh, uh, and uh, in several areas, both at the workplace and at home. And uh, if we lean in more or huddle further, we're going to fall over. So let's join hands. Thank you. And again, I encourage you uh, to take a few note of these sessions that sound the most intriguing to you. So far, I will be attending all of them. Our next commercial will be for the topic Speech Trek for Grownups, and that will be with Lana Widman. Good morning. There are two words that can strike fear in the hearts of many people. Public speaking. Why is that? And what can we do about it? Join me and the Speech Trek Committee as we explore this and other related questions during the Speech Trek for Grownups breakout session in room four. Thanks, Lana. Now, our next one will also be a video, and this is the topic is start a branch Tech Trek alumni group, which we call TTAG. And this is a video presented by Rosara Vallee. Would you like your Tech Trek alumni to continue their passion for STEM and follow through with a related career? And perhaps eventually become members of your AAUW branch? Come here now from two TTAG groups and from Tech Trek alumni like myself. Thank you, thank you, great. 
All right, our next um, topic commercial is for new ways to think about abortion presented by Joan Stromanis. Uh, as, as you uh, know, and you heard from uh, Lisa Motz, uh, this country is facing new challenges to abortion rights that are changing everything. Uh, this is happening without serious debate. I promise to help you to have a serious and respectful debate. No cliches, no black and white thinking, no demonizing the opposition, perhaps no arguments you've heard before. So please join me in room eight for that. Thank you. Uh, I've just received a note. For, perhaps I missed a room. My apologies. We would go back to cultural competency, the first step to understanding, which is presented by Barbara St. Urban. Hello. Hola. Shalom. I fast during Ramadan. I speak Swahili. I celebrate Hanukkah. I didn't know my husband when we married. I say origato, not thank you. I celebrate Kwanzaa. I eat tamales at Christmas. Do you know my culture? If not, come to my session and take the first step. Room number six. Thank you, my, my apologies for skipping that. You're definitely not skippable. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now we'll jump forward, forward to room nine, and that topic will be Ask Your Finance Committee, and that's hosted by Trail Guide Rolly Wendorf. Ask Your Finance Committee burning questions like, yikes, I'm a finance officer, what now? And where is all that great information hiding? It is the best show in town. You ask your questions and we give you the answers. Come to room nine and ask your finance committee. Thanks, Raleigh, for being right back on track with me. Okay, our next commercial is for room 10 and that is talking to opponents of a cause with Lenore Guilin. Good morning. Lisa Moss just publicized my workshop when she talked about divisiveness and fighting like a bucket of, of crabs. Tuning out opposition doesn't make it go away because millions of people agree. By engaging with controversial and offensive ideas, we hope to find common ground with the speakers and the audiences they attract. Come to room 10 to learn how to solve the problems that plague us by talking with opponents and making them understand us as we become good listeners. See you in room 10. Thank you, Lenore. You said you couldn't do it in 20 seconds and you did. <laughs> uh, next, is, next topic is in room 11 and that is who has AAUW helped? And that's hosted by Donna Lilly. Oh, hi, mom. It's your daughter, Donna Lynn. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I, I'm calling uh, to thank you for suggesting that I go on the AAW website and take their free Start Smart workshop. What were you doing? Yeah, 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 I did. I, I learned to negotiate my you know, salary and okay, benefits okay. for my first I'm job. I'm done. And then you oh, can go. I just I just asked you to My interview you went very well. Yes, mom, I start my new job at Google June 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See you at my graduation and see you in room 11. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Obviously, we're going now to room 12. If I can keep track of it a little bit better. And in room 12, the topic will be the branch of 2040. What does it look like? And that's hosted by Nancy Shoemaker. Hi all, the branch of 2040. Well, that depends on AIEW's mission of 2040. It depends on the state of the world in 2040. So bring your hopes, your fears, your ideas, and your crystal ball and prepare for a lively and wide ranging dis discussion. 
Thank you, perfect. Uh, the next room that's available is room 13, and that topic will be, is critical race theory hostile to white people? And that's gonna be hosted by Kathy Boxhoven. Join me for the true or false program on is critical race theory harmful to the white people's image. Now, the thing is, is that if you get the right answer, we will all do the virtual clapping. If you get the wrong answer, you're gonna hear this annoying sound. Join me. Thanks, thanks, Kathy. <laughs> I'm worried about that sound. Um, next, Downtime Hobbies with Gail Swain. Hi, I'm Gail Swain, and I'd love you to join me in room 14. As you know, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, and we don't want to be dull women or, or men. So we'll talk about hobbies. We'll talk about my hobbies, your hobbies, and you'll even find out what this is. Thanks. I'm still waiting to hear what that is. Um, all right, next, thank you, Gail. Next we have Putting Fun in Fundraising, and that is hosted by Karen Vanderworken. Keeping the fund in fundraising, come and get 10 free ideas. Share your best idea, ask your questions. She who has a, uh, <clears throat> she has a thing to sell is not as apt to get the dollars as she who climbs a tree and hollers. Come to room 15. Thanks, Karen. Uh, all right, and then we have obviously room 16 coming up and that topic will be embracing equity. And that's going to be hosted by Sharman Goring. Good morning, everyone. I've yet to hear of a branch that doesn't wish for new members. And we often say we'd like a more diverse membership. Retention is also a concern for many of us. How can we create a, a welcoming branch, one where everyone feels valued? An equity lens is one way to do so. Come learn how to use an equity lens and hear examples of why it's important, not only for the members we already have, but for also those we like to welcome to our branch. Room 16, thank you. Thanks, Sharman. And next is room 17, which is in fact my room. So let me get my video on. And this topic will be volunteering, is it dead? Hmm, where are they? There's nothing elementary, my dear Watson, about finding volunteers. It's a mystery. What has happened to the spirit of volunteering? How can we get people to step up? So let's put on our sleuthing hats and see if the modern volunteer is really a victim of murder. Join me. Don Johnson in room 17 to share clues to find volunteers. And now we'll pop over to room 18 and that topic is wine without the wine. And that's going to be hosted by Sharon Siebert. This is not a presentation. This is going to be a listening event. Having been involved at the state level for several years, You've all heard some of what we have accomplished so far. We'd like to know what you would like us to do better, what you would like us to do differently. That's why we're having this whining session, but there will be no drinking during it. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. No drinking? Hmm. I just moved that to the bottom of my list. Um, okay, and our last one, we'll be skipping room 19, that one's closed, we'll be going to room 20. And the topic there is very good advice. 
the importance of DEI in recruitment and retention. And that'll be hosted by Patrice Lynn. Hi, is there a different way to interact with current or potential members of color for authentic inclusion and long-term membership results? Why might age factor into it? Join us in the Very Good Advice Breakout Room for a safe space to speak freely and offer tips for continuous inclusion strategies in room 20. It's the place to be. Thank you, Patrice. So I hope that you can all see by the enthusiastic commercials that our hosts are very, very excited to talk to you about these topics that are very near and dear to their hearts. So soon later on, when we start our first set of sessions, again, Sandy will explain to you how to move around between these rooms so that you don't miss a moment. And uh, that will uh, close our commercials for this morning. And we can now go back to our regularly scheduled programming. Thank you, Dawn. That was so much fun. I want to go to all of them. They were, re they were really great. Uh, I was laughing a lot because they did such a good job. So I want to uh, now introduce us, all of us, back to Marlene Kane, who is our program director for Speech Trek. And she's going to tell us a little bit about Speech Trek and then introduce our first, uh, our first session, video number one. So Marlene. Thank you, Diane. The human brain starts working the moment you're born and never stops until you stand up to speak in public. Welcome to the adventure of public speaking. Unfortunately, when many people see that signpost that says public speaking, they take a detour. But fortunately, that's not the case uh, for our students today. For those of you who may not know, Speech Trek is in its 15th year started in 2007, and since then has empowered the next generation by giving them a voice on mission-based topics. And to date, AAUW California has awarded over $50,000 in cash prizes. So today you're gonna to see the culmination of the competition that began at the local branches. And how it works is that each local branch that participates has their contest. All contestants are videotaped and the, the first place winners a video is then uploaded to our AAUW California YouTube channel where a panel of judges views all the first place winners and they select the top five in the state. And then the uh, fourth and fifth place winners are given an honorable mention and their cash awards are on their way. The top three then advance to the finals where a new panel of judges views and, and evaluates those top three that you're going to hear today. Throughout the day, you'll see these videos. And at the end of our session, I will announce first, second, and third place. So the criteria, just again to review, is equally weighted between content and delivery, because we believe, as Lisa said earlier today, that Content is as important as being effective in how you say it. So it's what you say and how you say it, 50% content and 50% delivery. This year, the topic was of particular note and importance. Topics are always selected uh, on the basis of being related to our mission. Next slide, please. So it was a two-part question this year. Has the United States lived up to its pledge of liberty and justice for all? And the second part is, would requiring study of diversity, equity, and inclusion in a high school setting help ensure liberty and justice for all? And I might note that six months after we announced this topic, the state of California, along with some other states, did in fact approve a required course in eth ethnic studies uh, in order to graduate. And that will take place yeah, within a couple of years. So the top, that was a topic. All students, we uh, write original five to six minute speeches on this topic. And the, the comments from our judges this year was really, really gratifying. And we were very grateful to our judges who we will meet later. Next slide, please. 
these judges were quite impressed and uh, really inspires me when I see these comments, when I hear their reaction. And I really appreciate having uh, these judges devote their time and their thoughtfulness and their expertise. And again, you'll meet them shortly um, later on in, this, in the session. Next slide, please. So I would like to introduce speech track video number one, finalist Christine Sai from the Poway Penasquitos branch. April 24th, 2021. Maranatha High School's baseball team from Pasadena canceled a game against Damien High School after a racial slur occurred during pre-game warmups. June 19th, 2021. Coronado High School students hurled tortillas at students from Orange Glen High School, a mostly Latino high school from Escondido. August 20th, 2021. Valley View High School cheerleaders reported that they were subjected to racial epithets, threats, and mocking monkey noises during a football game against Temecula Valley High School. The Valley View High School football players also reported that they were called the N-word each time they were tackled. Also in August, 2021, Students from Salinas High School in Monterey County showcased pictures on Instagram of a black baby doll that they named Shaniqua. These posts include racial slurs and pictures of the doll with ankle monitors on. September 30th, 2021. A racist poster was made by one or more students from Yorba Linda High School and aimed at students from Esperanza High School in Anaheim prior to a football game poster it read your dad is my gardener ladies and gentlemen these are only a small window of events that have taken place within california high schools during the year 2021 that have reached headline news with so many students feeling intimidated or bullied to the point where they no longer feel safe in expressing their ethnicity race gender or religion these incidents show that we have fallen short on our pledge of liberty and justice for all. If our liberties are threatened by these unacceptable acts and not addressed with the young people, imagine what this means for the United States at large. That is why I support requiring the study of diversity, equity, and inclusion in a high school setting. Because one, Acts that demean an individual's ethnicity, race, gender, or religion are unacceptable and do not define who we are as Americans or who we want to be. Two, hate speech and defensive acts create hostile and unsafe environments for students who should not only be learning subjects such as reading and math, but also the value and beauty of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And Three, we must educate students to be better citizens of our community. As a high school student and a woman of color, I too have been the subject of hateful, mean-spirited words and acts by my classmates. I've witnessed firsthand the rise in hate against Asian Americans due to the coronavirus pandemic. Early on in the pandemic, a classmate of mine pulled back the corners of her eyes in a gross imitation of a Chinese student sitting beside me. When I confronted her on it, she simply stated, are you just saying that because your eyes look like his? I was left humiliated and furious. And the unfortunate reality is that I am not alone in my experiences. In 2020, two students from Bolsa Grande High School in Garden Grove showcased videos of them online shouting coronavirus as their Vietnamese classmate walked by in traditional dress. They then placed an Asian style hat on their heads while dancing and laughing before throwing the hat onto the ground. It's no surprise that the California Criminal Justice Statistics Center reported that anti-Asian crimes were up 107% in 2020. As best summarized by California Attorney General Rob Bonta, for too many, 2020 wasn't just about a deadly virus. 
It was about an epidemic of hate. We must stop this epidemic of hate, which is why I support Assemblyman Jose Medina's Assembly Bill 101, which was signed into law in October 2021. This bill requires California high school students to complete a semester's long ethnic studies course in order to graduate. And while Assembly Bill 101 focuses on ethnicity, I believe that when students gain a better understanding of each other's culture, they also gain a greater respect for all of those who have been historically marginalized. Education is the key because it aims to address the underlying hate and ignorance that leads to racism, sexism, and discrimination. Ladies and gentlemen, by educating the youth of America, we are putting ourselves on a path to a future where we don't wake up to negative news headlines. A future where hate crimes are a thing of the past, as opposed to commonplace happenings we're all witnessing today. Only then can we, as a nation, live up to our promise of liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Wow. Very nice, Christine, very nice. So that's just one sample of the three speech track contestants that we'll hear from today. And thank you, Marlene, for all your work on this program. Now we're gonna get ready for our first adventure. And thank you and welcome back everybody. I hope you had a good time and that everybody got safely back on your journey from your adventure. And the next part of our program is a very important part of AUW and that is AUW Fund. And our secretary, Lynn Batchelor, is also our AUW Fund Chair for the board. And she's going to be telling you all the good news and everything that's been happening with AUW Fund. So Lynn, over to you. Thank you, Diane. Of course, all successful projects require the commitment and the dedication of so many people. And AUW Fund is no different. So I'd like to take just a few minutes to acknowledge some of those people who have been vital to our very successful fund year. I want to start with the fund committee, Liz Bathgate, Janice Cook, Charmin Gehring, and Judy Horan, who manage our legacy circle, Raleigh Wendorf, Harriet Tower, who was last year's state named gift honoree, Sharon Westover and Diane Owens, who are both former fund chairs and who were wonderful resources for us, and Pamela Meyer, our scheduler. I also want to give a big shout out to our office manager, Julika Barrett. She produced 125 plus branch named gift honoree certificates with an additional two dozen to be completed next week. She also produced the traditional annual fund booklet. And since we're not in person, you won't be getting a paper copy of it in your hand as you leave the meeting, but it will be available very shortly on the website and you can download it yourself and produce your own copies. And Julika also disaggregated all the information from National about funds, which was provided to branches quarterly. I want to give a big shout out, <clears throat> excuse me, to our fellows and grant recipients who not only spoke at our fall events, but have made numerous presentations to branches. And some of the women have even spoken three times or more. We appreciate each and every one of you for giving us so much time from your very hectic schedules. And we congratulate you on the great honor that you got. My thanks to the branch fund chairs and VPs for their endless encouragement of their branch members, collecting and depositing money and checks, organizing fundraisers, providing names for the branch named gift honoree, downloading from the website, printing and presenting certificates to those who contribute to $100 or more and sending handwritten or email thank you notes to everyone who contributed. Thank you, we certainly couldn't do it without you. And now the moment you have been waiting for, the top 10, beginning with total contributions. All right, San Francisco Incorporated, $40,526. Marin Incorporated, $38,367. San Jose, $16,115. Carlsbad Oceanside Vista, 
$14,962. La Mesa El Cajon, $14,898. Haywood Castro Valley Incorporated, $14,808. Long Beach Incorporated, $14,369. Danville Alamo Walnut Creek, $14,314. Orinda Moraga Lafayette Incorporated, $13,700, and Sacramento, $13,203. You know, traditionally, we've always done the top 10, but when we get to the next slide, you will notice that it's the top 10 plus. And the reason for that is that the number 10 and what would have been 11 spot were only separated by about 75 cents. And the next furthest one down, number 12, was many dollars short. So the top 10 per capita branches, San Francisco Incorporated, $40,526. Marin, uh, sorry, I'm just reading from my wrong list. Berkeley, $597.56. Marin Incorporated, $259.24. Haywood Castro Valley Incorporated, $180.59. Palma Cerritos, $170.64. Carlsbad Oceanside Vista, $162.63. San Fernando Valley, $156.05. West Contra Costa, $133.18. Cabrillo Diego, $132.24. Long Beach Incorporated, $114.95. And Orinda Moraga Lafayette, $114.95. Sorry, $114.17. And Long Beach, $114.95. So congratulations and thank you to these top winners. And thank you to every single branch and individual who contributed. Next slide. There you see our total contributions, $494,020.04. So again, we appreciate everybody who contributed to that. Your generosity helped to fund in California this year, 19 American Scott Fellows, seven international fellows, two research publication grants, three selected profession fellows, five career development grants, and two community action grants. So congratulations one and all, and thank you so very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Randa Blanding, who's a vital member of the communications team, and the person who wrote the application for the candidate who was chosen for this year's state named gift honoree. So she has the, the honor of introducing her. Randa. Thank you, Lynn. This year's California's named gift honoree has only been an AEUW member for a few years. She saw a need and stepped up with her passion, her organization, organizing skills and directing skills and created a team that implemented a virtual tech trick for the past two years and again this year. She has been the impetus for hundreds of changed young women who will, in turn, because of this experience, have positive repercussions on many others. She is known as Dr. Mimi to those tech truckers. To others, she is Mary Isaac. Thank you, Dr. Mimi. Being this year's California named gift honoree is a well-deserved honor. Thank you, Randa. I'm not sure whether she is actually with us currently. She had a conflict and was hoping to join us, but we certainly wish to honor uh, Mary Isaacs. She's just done a remarkable job. It's uh, very well deserved for this honor. And at this time, it's my pleasure to present Judy Horan, who will, has information for us about the Legacy Circle. Hi, Lynn. It's, oops, am I on? Hello. Oh, good you're on. You're yes, on. you're on. Nice to see everyone this morning. And I want to pay special tribute to the Legacy Circle members who are on this uh, 
um, meeting today. And wow, it's been a wonderful morning and seeing all those branches and the money coming in. Uh, congratulations to the whole committee and Lynn, thanks for all your help this year. Anyway, um, I know many of you on the call, I think, and I don't know all of you, but hello to the people that I do know. Um, anyway, in keeping with the theme today, I have my own AUW land legacy circle adventure. Um, I, we're such a personal group in AUW that I just wanted to share with you um, how I came to really love the legacy circle. In the early 70s, when I was a very new member, which was a long time ago, I was at my second convention nationally in Washington, DC. And one of the uh, breakfasts was uh, something about a new program or something I didn't know about anyway. I think it was new and it was the Legacy Circle. And uh, my friends and I decided it was breakfast. So we always like to eat. So we went and this very young woman uh, was talking about the planned giving, which I will tell you was something totally unknown to me. And I was, you know, a single teacher at the time, and they were talking about my leaving money to people. And I thought, I don't have any money. Uh, you know, what is this all about? And then um, she took the time afterwards to meet with us. We asked some more questions. And by the time I went home, I had filled out the application. And I will tell you that what I put down on there, because there's no minimum, and what I put down there was very, very meager. And I just thought, oh my goodness, that's so much, you know, will I ever live long enough to give that much money? And it wasn't very much. But as I went on in AUW, I went from, you know, my branch to the state to the national and devoted so much time and energy and got back all the leadership skills that I now have and I'm still using. Um, and so what do I owe AUW? I owe them so much, so much in leadership and the friendships with many of you who are on this call today uh, and are, they're so meaningful to my life and I will always take that with me. And I, I really think of paying it forward. And that's how I look at the Legacy Circle. Um, when you join the Legacy Circle, you are making a commitment. And I will be very honest with you that over the years I kept adding to what I was doing and changing, because you can change these wills and trusts and whatever. And, and, and now at this time in my life, uh, AUW is you know, going to do very well, I hope, depending on how everything goes. But anyway, it's such a simple thing. It's a one page application. They just ask you some questions. Um, you know, well, how do you want to do this? You can do trust, you can give gift annuities, retirement plans, real estate, life insurance, they'll take anything. So you need to look into this. And those of you who are Legacy Circle members, I'm really reaching out to you today. I think that um, we should do kind of an each one get one in California. We have competition in our group, which is nationwide and Charmin likes to do contests. So this might be another idea we can come up with. And I love working with Charmin. She's doing five things today. So um, thanks for all her help. She handles the North, I handle the South, but it's interchangeable. So if you wanna contact either one of us, we're both in the directory and go on our website, the AUW website to Legacy circle and you'll find all the information and how simple it is and someone in planned giving can help you if you have particular questions. I can't think of a better way to say thank you to AUW than to know that in the future some women and God knows we need it now more than ever. So thank you for this opportunity and I hope you'll give serious consideration to joining Legacy Circle. We'd love to have you and then oh I should put my pin more prominently and we'll give you a beautiful pin to symbolize your uh, relationship with the legacy circle. So thanks for this opportunity and thanks California for a great convention. My God, Lisa Matz and, you know, Jackie Spear and soon to come Gloria. This is a wonderful day. So thanks for everything. Have a good day. Thank you. And I just want to give a special shout out to Judy and Sharman because between the two of them, they have gotten eight new members this year for the Legacy Circle. So hopefully she will have other people join them as well. Thank you very much. Diane. 
Okay, well, thank you, Lynn and Randa and Judy for your really nice remarks about AUW Fund and what it offers. And uh, we can be very proud of all the scholars, all of our fellows and grant recipients that study in California. So uh, that's really, really, really good. So thank you very much for your time and all of your effort and everybody out in the branches that you know hold, you hold your fundraisers and do all of this for AUW Fund. And um, it's the heart of AUW and we all know that. So thank you very much. Now I would, you know, this is a business meeting. And so we have to find out, do we have any money? How are our finances going? And with that, I'd like to introduce our CFO, Roly Wendorf. Good morning, everyone. Uh, time to talk about our money. Do we have any, as Diane said? Uh, next slide, please. I'll get right down to, to it. Um, I'm pleased to report uh, that the AUW California finances are doing well. Uh, we have uh, over $129,000 in our checking account and the total of our investments on 31st of March was 436,923. So this sum of money is uh, kept in three different buckets, reserves for our operating account, reserves for special projects, and a general reserve uh, cash fund. Uh, the, the, the first two reserves are maintained as managed funds uh, to provide uh, better dividends and interest, and the, the cash reserve is just for an emergency uh, in case uh, uh, funds uh, fall short or we don't get adequate membership dues. Uh, over the past year, the General Reserve Fund has changed. We had $50,000 in it before, and it, we, we saw it as a convention reserve fund. In case, uh, you know, when we're doing a convention, uh, we are not able to follow through. We have to cancel unexpectedly. And so it was kind of a self-insurance fund. But now that in-person conventions have become less common, uh, we are uh, doing, um, uh, we have converted it to a more general reserve fund with a smaller amount so that more of it can be invested as managed funds. Our investments, so how did we do this year? Our investments at the end of last year, uh, June 30th, 2021, were 400 $28,000. And then to that last year, we added $22,000 from our checking account. So we would have had a total of $450,000 if we didn't make any uh, more money. Uh, these funds that were transferred were what was left over from the, the previous year. Uh, but we have had a market loss of $13,239, which accounts for almost 3% uh, between um, up to March 31. And in fact, in April, the, the uh, 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 market has been tanking even more. So I think if I look today, it would be lower than that. So. Um, that's the story with that. Next slide, please. Uh, our membership dues income uh, is, is 163,720. Uh, we budgeted 170,000. So we have a shortfall of about 3.69%. Uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, each year for the past many years, we've been having a shortfall in membership dues. Uh, this year, it is uh, the, the shortfall is less than it has actually been in the previous two years. But we would certainly like to see, uh, you know, membership dues coming in greater than what we expected. Expenses to date are one hundred and three thousand five sixty three. So if you uh, uh, compare the dues income with the expenses. Uh, we, we see that we have uh, $60,000 for the remaining uh, quarter that is um, remaining for us. Where does this money go? 
Uh, we spent $25,000, uh, $26,000, roughly 25% of the expenses have been uh, related to AUW California maintaining an office. So we have, uh, we have a, a part-time office manager, very capable, and we couldn't function without her. Uh, we have and so other costs that are, uh, so not only her salary, but also like internet and phone services, storage, workers' comp insurance, uh, are the mailbox we maintain, a variety of costs related to maintaining our AW California presence are put in this category. Uh, the other big area where we spend money is public policy. 50% uh, uh, of our expenses go there. We heard about the great work that has been going on there, public policy making an impact with AUW issues at the California state level is a very important part of what AUW California does. Uh, the remaining 25% of the funds are divided into uh, among several categories, 10% in software and website as we are starting to do more and more online and virtually. Those expenses have uh, gone up a bit. Marketing, we're trying to get um, uh, new members. And so we paid a marketing consultant. Most of the, the 5,079 has gone towards our marketing consultant. We have, we pay a CPA, we hire a CPA to do our annual financial review and also do our annual uh, reporting uh, of taxes and all the government uh, filings. Uh, even though AUW California is nonprofit, we do need to do annual filings, uh, paperwork. So that accounts for 6%. And then there are a number of uh, costs like printing and mailing and costs for the elections and other smaller costs, which account for another 3%. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, so some general uh, comments. Uh, on it, our state finances are in good shape. As I said, we, we do not need to increase state dues. We have not increased state dues in the last several years. We expect to end this year in the black. Uh, uh, we have, you know, another, it's been another COVID year. So we've had all our board meetings on Zoom. We're doing this annual event on Zoom. We did our annual committee day on Zoom. In the before times, that is pre-COVID, Actually, some of those accounted for significant expenses, the board meetings, the committee day, and also the annual events usually ran at a loss. Uh, membership income is down, but less than the previous year. Investments, the market is not doing very well, and so our investments are down. Uh, we will, uh, we do, after the year ends, we do an annual review in the September timeframe when our CPA produces an annual report, and then that goes on the website in October. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, word on the great work our committees are doing, the finance and investment committees. We This year, we uh, newly formed an investment subcommittee to specifically provide oversight for our investments. It is chaired by Kathy Ford. There are four members, three of whom are new recruits, and we're very proud of that, the fourth one being me. And we have a consultant, Peggy Cavanis, from the National Board who helps us. Uh, the investment, uh, there has been a huge improvement in how we are tracking our investments. We now do quarterly tracking with the financial advisor, and these are based on benchmarks and based on our investment policies. Uh, the Finance Committee is also doing very good work. This is, it's focused primarily on uh, branch support, uh, education for branches, providing uh, materials. We will be doing a webinar on annual uh, government reporting on May 24th at 7 p.m. Uh, the registration link is up on the website and will be broadcast in the Board to Board and California Connections. Uh, we are, uh, uh, we, we have uh, breakout rooms today, ask your finance committee another opportunity to ask your questions. 
uh, for, for the past year and a half, we have been working with IBCs to uh, get the, uh, you know, how the finances are handled um, in line and the policy has been updated uh, accordingly. Uh, we are in the process <clears throat> of, of reorganizing our website um, and uh, uh, we, we, there is a lot of good information up there uh, and, and hopefully with the reorganization, reorgani it'll be even easier to find. And one new activity this year has been that the finance committee is providing some oversight to tech track finances as well. So it's a very busy committee and we have very capable uh, professionals on it. So, and that's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you, Roly. It's great to have you on board and have our finances in really, really good hands. So thank you for all of your effort. I know you've been very busy this year with the IBCs and all kinds of new endeavors. So we really appreciate that. Really appreciate that. So now our next keynote speaker is a wonderful woman who has just recently been named as the Chief Executive Officer of AUW. But she's not new to AUW. She's been with AUW since 2004. In addition to her role as CEO, she's also AUW's main representative to the United Nations. And I know from her schedule, she is also very, very busy meeting with other organizations, mostly women's organizations, but and people in the White House, because we've been called back there to do some good work for them. She, uh, in her role since 2004, joining AUW, she has been involved with the management of AUW's highly esteemed fellowships and grants program that we just talked about which has awarded more than $70 million in funding to women scholars and programs in the US and overseas. She has been the driving force behind AUW's signature program, including salary negotiation trainings. And that training has reached nearly 190,000 women nationwide, mostly women, I think. She's worked with pay equity initiatives with public officials in Washington, D.C., New York City, Boston, and Pittsburgh, as well as with numerous other cities and states. She's worked with the National Science Foundation to increase girls' participation in science, technology, engineering, and math, which spells STEM, as you all know. And she's notably expanded AUW's outreach to girls and women of color. Before she came to AUW in 2004, she was the director of a African education programs, Africa education programs at the Institute of International Education. She's also been a Peace Corps staff member and a volunteer in Africa. And she holds a master's degree in education and human development from the George Washington University, a bachelor's degree in international affairs from the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Services at Georgetown University. And she's also studied at the American University in Paris. We are so glad to have Gloria with us today. This is her first visit to AUW California as the CEO of AUW. So let's give a warm welcome to Gloria Blackwell. Thank you so much, Diane. It's really a pleasure to be here with everyone here at AAUW California. It's always a pleasure to have the opportunity to be engaged with AAUW members, so I definitely appreciate the opportunity. And I'm here to uh, give you some information about not just what's been happening at AAUW National, but how you can work with us and how we can all be aligned as we move towards AAUW's uh, mission. So thank you so much. I also wanna make sure certainly that I thank those of you who are participants in our 
Champions Program for Women and Girls, um, the great report that Judy gave around those who are participating in the Legacy Circle, and just the, when, the many ways that we all know that AAUW California contributes to advancing the mission of AAUW. So thank you all. I also know that a number of of branches are celebrating, um, you know, historic uh, anniversaries this year. I, I saw a, a list, and I think if I went down that list, that it would take up all of the time that I have to speak today, so I won't. But I did want to point out the Marin branch that apparently is celebrating its 90th anniversary. So congratulations to the Marin branch and to all of the AAUW branches uh, that continue um, each and every day to engage in the activities that are so important for women and girls. So I'm excited to be here as the CEO of AAUW representing uh, the national office. We've done a lot of great work. Um, we're gonna talk a bit about that, about the successes and about some of the challenges uh, that have happened. Uh, you know, it's been really great, uh, as, as Diane mentioned, that I've been with AAUW for, for a little bit of time. And so I've had the opportunity to be engaged with so many of you um, and to really see the great work that happens in our states and branches. Um, my career has been dedicated to working with women and girls, both domestically and internationally. And working with AAUW has certainly been a highlight. Um, and it's really important to me that the work that AAUW does continues to grow and it continues to build upon its success. And so I've been focusing not just as CEO, but even prior to becoming CEO, on leveraging our successes and continuing to grow our impact as an organization. I want us to keep building on what has worked well, to learn from it, to innovate and to also make sure that we continue to expand our influence in our audience. And so the past two years have been exciting, they have been challenging, but we've all adapted and pivoted, um, not without a small amount of creativity and tenacity. So thank you all for everything that you do. Okay, next slide, please. So yes, that's me at the footsteps of the Supreme Court uh, when the confirmation hearings began for Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, okay? It has been an exciting few months uh, ascending to the role of CEO at AAUW. And it's been really important to note that AAUW has been there every step of the way, making sure that we were in the right places and engaging in the right and relevant activities. So at a time when face-to-face -face wasn't an option, like I mentioned, AAUW hosted dozens and dozens of webinars and virtual trainings reaching over 25,000 participants, including launching new programs, teaching girls about STEM, as well as financial uh, management for women. At a time when our democracy was under threat, AAUW made sure that we used our powerful voice um, to advocate for voting rights and all of those policies that you well know in California that are important to make sure that we are supporting fair policies for women and girls. And at a time when women were struggling financially, we continued our research to ensure that we were highlighting how the pandemic intensified an already challenging situation for women and highlighted both the gender and racial inequities that were put in front of everyone during the pandemic. And that's why AAUW's collective work is so important. It really is important that we use the approach of education, advocacy, and research that we've pretty much perfected over the past 140 years uh, to make sure that we adapt it as needed. But it is an approach that has worked for this organization. And it's an approach that we use to ensure that all women are lifted up. Uh, I've also focused in my first few months as, as CEO on listening, learning, and connecting, both internally and externally. And it's really just been great to get to know more members, to get to know the more members of the women's community and the equity coalitions. Um, and I've also had an opportunity to witness firsthand how you in the states and branches have also had to pivot and have had to learn new ways of engaging. That has also allowed you to leverage success to grow the impact of AAUW. 
Next slide. Because it was really important that we all pivot during the pandemic, because as you can see, hovering there above our success in the right hand corner is the COVID-19 pandemic, right? So you, you pivoted to virtual programs and fundraising, and it didn't stop any of us from moving the AUW mission forward. When we asked you to step up and step up and contribute to our greatest needs fund, you answered the call. It has been terrific. So thank you very, very much. It really allows us to fund our mission forward programs um, quickly uh, outside of all of the funding that we do have for our amazing fellowships, as was spoken about earlier. Um, when, we, when we asked you to advocate fiercely for our policy priorities, you stepped up sending over 70,000 letters to elected officials uh, advocating for the policies that have the impact and that mean the most to advancing women and girls. You called for action on paid leave, on the child care tax credits, on student loan forgiveness, and more. So thank you. And in addition, I'm certainly proud of the way that you've embraced our five-star recognition program. Uh, it really is important that we are in alignment across the board with AAUW strategic priorities. Um, I'm so thankful that there are so many California branches that have participated in the program. And since it began a few years ago, over 100 states and branches have participated in this important program. And it's important because one of the things that I need everyone to know is that AAUW's collective impact is what we need to be pushing forward. We need to make sure that our collective story is out there and people understand and organizations understand and politicians understand the ways in which AAUW has fiercely fought and will continue to fiercely fight to move advocacy forward for women and girls. But we can only do that if we're telling our collective story and our collective impact is out there for all to see. Our collective impact nationally at the state, local and even globally is what sets AAUW apart from other organizations. And it has allowed us to flourish and thrive for over 140 years now. Slide four. So thank you very much because membership does matter. And everything in that last slide talks about membership mattering. And that means that you matter. And so listening, learning, and connecting, uh, not just with states and branches, but making sure that AAUW is out there, that people know who we are, that people begin to recognize and we reintroduce ourselves um, to many of the spaces where we have not been present. So my job has also been making sure that AAUW has been in the right spaces, that AAUW is talking to the right people. Um, we've been in the right conversations, not just about racial, but also gender equity and inclusivity. So as you can see from this slide, from the White House Women's History Month celebration attended by the President, the First Lady, and so many other members of the Cabinet and Congress, uh, to the Feminist State of the Union with our friends at the National Organization for Women, AAUW has been in the room. That includes embassy events as well. It includes major media outlets where we have been making sure that the issues that we want on the forefront are being paid attention to. And if you look at the, the White House Women's History Month picture, the woman in the orange jacket is actually one of California's own representatives, uh, Representative uh, Nanette uh, Barragon, who actually I spent quite a bit of time with because we were all taking pictures together. So AAUW is making sure that we're in the right rooms and having the conversations with the right people. Next. And that also includes other activities by, like making sure that we're on Capitol Hill. Uh, we had the pleasure to attend the event organized by Speaker Nancy Pelosi in honor of Billie Jean King and women athletes during Women's History Month as well, honoring Title IX. Um, and we were pleased to have an opportunity to meet uh, Gwendolyn Mink, the daughter of the late Representative Patsy Mink, whom we all know um, was instrumental in ensuring the passage of Title IX. AAUW National will also be having a celebration of Title IX 
everyone will be invited. It will be virtual on June 23rd so that we can continue not just to celebrate this milestone, but to make sure that we continue to work on the protections and the implementation of Title IX. Because AAUW started work on Title IX as far back as 1945, when we were one of the first organizations to send out surveys to college campuses, finding out how women were being treated on those campuses. And so that research laid the groundwork for so much of what we see today. Next. And so we're staying focused on our strategic focus areas that were established um, and re reintroduced in 2020 as our strategic plan 2.0, where we also added racial equity, inclusivity, and STEM as priorities. So we're staying focused on education and training, economic security, leadership and governance and sustainability. Next. I have so my phone. phone. More of the successes that have taken place, some of which you've heard about, some of which you may not know. Education has been the cornerstone of AAUW, and we continue in that tradition, not just with our fellowships and grants, but by also introducing new programs. So this current academic year, we awarded the largest amount of fellowships and grants ever. But I didn't think that we would top it by this upcoming year, awarding even more funding to deserving scholars and community-based programs. So we just completed our round of selection panels and approvals and sent out the word to oh, 320 recipients this year who will be receiving $6 million in fellowships and grants. All of you deserve a round of applause, applause for the support that you have given to our fellowships and grants. And it keeps AAUW as one of the large, largest funders exclusively for graduate women. In addition to our fellowships, we also launched AAUW STEM Ed for Girls, our virtual STEM program, focusing on high school girls in grades 9 through 12, focusing particularly on Latinas and African American girls and their caregivers. Very successful program funded, the pilot was funded by the Arconic Foundation. Uh, it has been reintroduced for a second year with additional funding from Arconic as well as new funding from the Baxter International Foundation so that AUW can continue to make sure that we are having an impact on STEM careers and continuing to build a strong pipeline for the future. AUW Money Smart was another pilot that we introduced last summer with funding from the Coca-Cola Foundation. And it was and it was spun from our salary negotiation programs because we were also hearing that financial education was a key component that so many of our young women and workers were lacking. So STEM Ed for Girls focused in part on ensuring that we brought in a diverse and inclusive audience, uh, knowing that women of color suffer a disproportionate pay gap as well as a wealth gap. So we were able in the pilot to train over a thousand men, women in our three-part series Money Smart program. Um, and finally, our National Conference for College Women Student Leaders, also known as Nick Whistle. Thank you so much for all of the women that you support to attend Nick Whistle. It was virtual last year. Everyone missed all of the hugs and, and, and all of the selfies. It will be virtual again, but we still have the capacity to ensure that over a thousand young women have the opportunity to gain important leadership and advocacy skills. This year's keynote for Nick Whistle will be Pulitzer Prize winner and New York Times uh, writer, creator of the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who we know will bring an important and timely message to our students. Next. In the area of economic security, which is key to everything that we do as well, and key to the fact that we've certainly had our work cut out for us this, these past few years with the pandemic. Um, the pandemic certainly in, intensified so many of the inequities that were already in place. And it meant that women, obviously, and of course women of color who were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, had to suffer the, br the brunt of the resulting economic fallout and the job losses. And so that's another reason why AAUW's collective voice is so important. Um, 
With your help, we lobbied for economic relief during the pandemic, including student loan forgiveness, the child tax credits, as I mentioned before. Uh, we also published critical new research, which really highlighted the impact of the pandemic. Early last year, we worked on the, the Latina project, which certainly demonstrated the inordinate impact uh, that the pandemic had on the health and economic status of Latinas. And just a few months ago, through a survey uh, in New York City, uh, we were able to find uh, that, you know, one in three women weren't earning enough to meet basic expenses like food and, and, and transportation. And all of this in information is important, making sure that we have the research to back up the advocacy that we are pushing forward. Um, you know, and I think that we are also been moving forward, not just on research on groups of women, we've also been increasing the opportunities for economic security, working with individual women and providing opportunities for them. We were able to grow our salary negotiation programs this year, working with historically black colleges and universities, as well as minority serving institutions as well. Um, that also included our financial education training in terms of training for individual women to expand their ability to improve their professional development. So this content has been really, really important because it is allowing us um, to continue to grow a new group of supporters and activists for AUW and leaders um, in their workplaces and, we're, and bringing them into the work that we are doing with our organization. Uh, so those are the ways that we are working. And certainly the gender pay gap remains a priority for AAUW. Um, we are hoping one day to work ourselves out of a job. It hasn't happened yet. Um, it's another, it's certainly another important point for our collective advocacy and our collective impact as an organization. Um, so the, what you do locally, what you do at the state level, whether it's organizing equal payday activities, uh, whether it's you know, being a two-minute activist, all of those activities are incredibly important. Your work matters, not just locally, but it matters nationally as well. It really helps build the success of AEW as an organization. Um, you know, we have a broader story to tell. So the advocacy that we do around pay equity, working on legislation, um, the work that we do around salary negotiation is important as well. But we know that it's not just about fixing women. And the work also that we are doing to ensure that employers are doing their part is important. Uh, this year as well, we conducted a, a series of events in, in New York, uh, Equal Pay Every Day, where we worked with managers, where we worked with um, leaders as well as other employers to make sure that they understand the critical role that they play as well. Because we really want policymakers and everyone to know that you know it's no longer an option to continue with this, the systemic discrimination and um, the way in which the, the gender pay gap remains stubborn, knowing that we have solutions that can help eradicate it. Um, so we're going to continue leading the conversation about the pay gap and so many other issues. We're going to continue to work in coalition with our partners in DC and across the country. And we're going to continue to make sure that the few silver linings that came out of the pandemic, you know, shining that harsh light on the fact that work didn't actually work, particularly for women and mothers, to make sure that we are using it as an opportunity to leverage our success and grow our impact. Next slide. Our, our next pillar around leadership overlaps with so many of the other areas that we work in. Um, so I'll briefly just, just mention, um, as Diane mentioned, I'm AAUW's United Nations representative. And so that means that we, we are engaged in many conversations about advancing equity for women and girls globally, not just in our own country. So we did participate once again with the Commission on the Status of Women, presenting a well-attended panel talking about increasing women's leadership and economic security uh, post-pandemic. Uh, and our speakers were our wonderful AAUW fellows and, and fellowship and grant alumni, uh, bringing that issue to the forefront. 
You also know that our 140th anniversary celebration was so successful because we were able to elevate the accomplishments of one of our top ranking alumni, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala, the first woman and African to ascend to the position of Director General of the World Trade Organization. These and so many other events are part of the virtual programming with women leaders that has reached more than 25,000 individuals during the past two years um, and increasing the leadership opportunities through critical training um, for women and others. Uh, so thank you all for using the opportunity to attend that training and know that those training opportunities and those webinars and those videos are available for you to use in your own local and statewide training. Um, in addition, we did some higher education leadership research this year, focusing on the top 130 research institutions with our partners at the EOS Foundation. Uh, the Women's Power Gap at Elite University scaling the ivory tower didn't come as that much of a, as a surprise to so many of us, but it was an incredible report that actually pointed out that these top institutions are not doing a great job at making sure that women and women of color are leading their institutions, that only 22% of the presidents at these institutions are women, and only 5% are women of color. Um, this in light of the fact that since the late 1970s, women have earned um, more college degrees than men, that women of color are the fastest growing college population, um, and the fact that we just aren't seeing the progress when it comes to women's leadership in the post-graduation world. And that it's not just about higher education, it's about all sectors. And I know, and I'm sure that many of you know that sadly, you know, it's not about, it's, it's, it's a way that we have to keep thinking about how can we move it forward? Because we can do better. And these are the things that, that wake me up every day and keep me going and inspire me to make sure that we are making this change. Because I know that change can happen. We've seen it in the makeup of our current Congress. I'm sure you talked about that earlier. Uh, I see it in our First Lady, you know, who is, you know, one woman who has conquered multiple firsts. Because yes, we're still talking about first. And I really also see it in the brilliant and inspiring and eminently qualified Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, the first black woman, you know, to be confirmed to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, next slide. Leadership is important. And this was a key component of seeing leadership and seeing representation. AAUW was there at the White House when we all had the opportunity to celebrate the confirmation of Justice Jackson. And it's because of your advocacy that these and so many other issues move forward. So thank you. Next slide. So finally, our last pillar is governance and sustainability. And it is a key pillar because without it, we wouldn't be able to accomplish so much of what we uh, are able to accomplish. Because being a sustainable organization, it means we have a balanced budget. It means that we have the right talent in place. It means that we have the right technology in place, not just for our national staff, but for our members as well. And then it needs to be updated, then it needs to be functioning. Um, the latest technology update, as you all know, is our new community hub that was launched in, uh, in February or March. Uh, and we're looking forward to the complete rollout of our community hub. I know it's been challenging. Obviously, as CEO, I would have wanted it to you know, to not have been as challenging. But I will give credit to the amazing AEW national staff that they are doing all that we can to help, ev help everyone adapt to these new systems. It's been nearly 20 years since AAUW national has had this kind of an upgrade to our systems. But we will get there and we thank you for your patience and we thank you for your grace. You can still be in touch with the, con the Connect staff with our office hours every Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Still available to field your questions, where we'll still be putting out training so that all of our leaders understand how the system will be functioning. But for now, we need your patience, so thank you.
very, very much. On the governance side, we're looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion. We need you to help make our community more diverse and inclusive. Um, we can't do it without you. There are a host of resources that are available to help you do that, to help you learn, to help you lead others. So please check out those um, resources that are available on the AEW website. And I hope you'll consider, if you haven't already, creating a diversity officer position within your state or branch. There is a volunteer cohort of diversity officers, so you can network and share information. Next slide. So I'll wrap up with a call to action, because as you all know, uh, activism, from all of our activism work, a call to action separates good intentions from real change. Uh, because if the past couple of years have taught us anything, it's that inequity is at the root of everything that ails us as a nation. So I want to be clear that the work that we are doing is incredibly important. It could not be more important than it is at this moment in time. And the work that we could, we do can't be done without you. And so we need you to continue to make the work relevant. Please participate in the Five Star Recognition Program. Please reflect on our core mission objectives. Think about the work that I've been talking about uh, during this presentation. Think about the ways in which you can also include more racial equity inclusion in your conversations and in the work that you are doing. Um, think about how the work that you are doing contributes to our four pil strategic pillars as well. Think about how you can help each other do more um, and how you can use your success and the success of all the affiliates to leverage all that success and grow AAUW's impact. Those without saying, please contribute to our Greatest Needs Fund. It provides us with the most flexibility. It provides us with the most opportunity to ap apply funding no matter what to meet the needs of the moment. I'd also like to encourage you to contribute $50 in honor of Title IX's 50th anniversary, not just to celebrate the past, but also to make sure that we are we are building an investment to the future because it's not over. We will be acknowledging all of the branches and states during the actual celebration on June 23rd. And finally, please don't discount your voice and your own power as an individual AAUW member. Decide what issues you want to be an advocate for. Become a two-minute activist. Please vote in our elections that actually choose um, our leaders that actually help us with important governance issues. Uh, your, your voting matters as well. Next slide. So thank you all so much. We know that the pandemic exposed what wasn't working, but we also saw how AAUW states and branches like California came together uh, stood up and made sure that your voices were heard, made sure that the issues important to AAUW were put in the spotlight and that action was actually taken. Uh, there are so many opportunities to affect lasting change um, for women and girls. This is a pivotal moment in our history. Um, I want everyone to understand that we all want fairness. We all want equity. Um, we all want an equal shot at success by eliminating the barriers to society to, that have kept women back in society. AAUW has played a key and leading role in that success. Thanks to all of you and thanks to all of your contributions. Um, we know that it's not just a women's issue. We know that we need systemic change. Um, and we know so many of the solutions are there in order to make it happen. Thank you for listening and thank you so much for adding your voice and your time and your talent and all of your resources to help generations of women and girls um, be successful and realize their dreams. Because for 140 years, AAUW has been a leader. And as we leverage our success and grow our collective impact together, I'm really confident that the best is yet to come to realize AAUW's vision of equity for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria, for coming to California.
and enlightening us about everything that's happening in Washington, D.C. We, we actually feel pretty close to Washington, D.C., even though it's we're good. kind of far away, but it really helps that you came out and highlighted all of the things that are happening. It's exciting. It really is exciting. And thank I you so much. like you that good things are going to come from this. So. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Diane. I do have a little secret to tell you. I was in California. Uh, I was in San Francisco this past week for about 48 hours, and then I took the red eye home, uh, attending the Power Plus Summit on behalf of AAUW. But I do hope that I will be able to come back and see all of you in person. Yes. Yes, we hope so too. We hope so too. Thank, Thank you, you for spending this time with us. It's really, really good. Thank you. Thanks. Already. Bye bye. Bye. And now we we have the opportunity to hear our second speech track contestant. So Marlene, come on back. Thank you so much, Diane. The public speaking adventure continues. Here is our second speech track video from Fremont Branch, finalist, Rhea Jane. My name is Rhea Jane and I'm from the AAUW Fremont Branch. When I was in third grade, my teacher asked the class to stand up in front of the American flag and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Being an enthusiastic eight-year-old, I immediately put my hand to my chest and said the words, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. But wait, as time went on and I grew older, I began to wonder to myself, were these words even true? Was America truly promising a freedom, a, a future of liberty and justice for all? The answer, unfortunately, is no. The United States has not lived up to its promise. Throughout history, we've seen new forms of discrimination rise up to overtake the old. We see violence and structural discrimination against Black and Asian Americans breaking apart communities. And year after year, we ask ourselves, what can we do to make a change in that system? Instead of saying liberty and justice for all, I ask liberty and justice when? For hundreds of years, history has supported the narratives of white supremacy one of the most prominent taking its roots in the United States. All men are created equal, words written by our founding fathers who also owned slaves. But back then, black men weren't even considered equal and women weren't even in the equation. But I know what you're thinking. America was able to move forward. After all, we abolished slavery, right? Unfortunately, such paints an incomplete picture. After the abolition of slavery, we saw new forms of discrimination, such as the, the domestic terrorist groups, such as the KKK, Black Coats, and Jim Crow laws. And a hundred years later, we see gerrymandering, voter discrimination, and redlining, all preventing minorities from having the same kind of rights. I ask you, is this the democracy that we've fought so hard for? Because the same injustices that existed 200 years ago are not gone. They have merely taken a different form. Instead of saying liberty and justice for all, I ask liberty and justice for who? Week after week, we see horrific, heartbreaking stories on the news about Black people being disproportionately targeted by the police. Black people are 2.5 times more likely to be killed by the police, even though they're two times more like, unlikely to be armed. As an Indian American woman, I've seen the way that this has affected my community. It starts at the top with a lack of social mobility, leaving people unable to progress beyond their current social status and making poverty a generational cycle. And then it trickles down to everyday racism and harassment that becomes normalized in our society. We have all seen it in the way that this pandemic was blamed as a result of the Chinese virus, in the slurs, in the microaggressions. I have seen it in the stereotypes, the mockery, the promise that you would be better off if you had lighter skin. But most of all, I hear it in the question, no, but where are you really from? With people unsatisfied until they've heard that my parents were immigrants because a person of color couldn't possibly be a true American. And yet we teach our children to sit back and tolerate these injustices 
starting from insensitive comments at school to employee discrimination at work. We have gone on too long proclaiming that the color of our skin is not a barrier to equality. So finally, instead of saying liberty and justice for all, I ask liberty and justice how? True equality seems like a far off horizon, like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that we have been trying to reach, but can never grasp. But to truly move forward, America must learn to dismantle systemic and implicit biases that have plagued us from the very beginning. And the only way that we can do this is by teaching the next generation of students, high school students, through measures such as diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, and other ethnic sentence programs to create a better future. If we can teach our children about 9-11, Auschwitz, Christopher Columbus, and all the horrors befallen towards white people, then we can teach them about the same injustices and oppression that the people of color of different races, genders, sexualities, and more have faced since the beginning of America. Some might say that we are too young to learn about oppression and inequality, or worse, that our youth might become brainwashed to feel guilty, that these are conversations for adults. But I would argue that these conversations start even earlier, as soon as we can walk or talk. Black children are told, keep your head down when talking to a police officer. Don't talk back or you'll get shot. Young girls are told, smile more. Don't be so aggressive when you speak. These values are ingrained in us from youth. So I ask, why obstruct us from learning them anyway? Studying diversity, equity, and inclusion is necessary. It may not create massive change overnight, but it is the, the right step in promoting a better future for all Americans. So at the end of the day, I ask yourselves, do we truly live in a land where liberty and justice are accessible to all? Not quite, but by incorporating DEI and ethnic studies into classrooms, we are opening ourselves up to difficult but honest conversations about our nation's next chapter in this long epic journey. Educating high schoolers about the real history of our nation leads to better educated adults and better informed voters who will make their decisions off of knowledge instead of prejudice or fear. And so this is how we create structural change by individually changing the mindsets of the population, we pave the path for a better world. And yes, it may not be perfect, but the blinders have come off once and for all. Our country is riding this DEI wave right now. Some want to ride it, some want to hide from it, but it's here for sure, sweeping from coast to coast. And I encourage all of us, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, to ride this wave with me into a better future for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. That was really great. So, one more great video from our speakers, Raya Jane from Fremont Branch. That was really, really good. So it's been quite a morning. I think it's been a great morning. I'm just really inspired. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Sandy to give us directions for lunch. They're very simple. Go have some. So we'll return <laughs> at 12.45. And we will start our second adventure of the day uh, with our branch activity of the year awards. So please, um, it would be helpful if you muted if you haven't already and turned your video off and we'll see you back here at 1245. Thank you. But how it was... <laughs> I'll wait a minute and do it again. Welcome back, everybody, from lunch. I know it was a fast lunch, so hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we're ready to go for the afternoon. So this afternoon, I would like to introduce Sandy Gabe again, who needs no introduction, obviously, because she's been doing so much for us already today and will continue to do that. She's also the chair of the Branch Activity Committee. And so she will be presenting uh, our awards for 2022. So Sandy. Thank you, Diane. Deepak Chopra said, all great changes are preceded by chaos. We've had a little bit of chaos in our lives over the past couple of years. And today's meeting format is an example of how we responded to the chaos of not being able to meet in person and harness the opportunity 
to change to allow more members and leaders to gather virtually today to share our successes. Many branches didn't allow the chaos to stop them, but used to, to propel them forward and to continue to inspire and engage their communities. The Branch Activity of the Year Awards provide an opportunity to discover and reward branches who created novel, inspirational, and reproducible programs that promote AAUW's mission and image. This year, nine branches accepted the challenge of sharing their successes. Their projects covered a variety of topics and formats, from a theater production to individual phone calls to engage members. And you can find a summary of our, those projects on our website. Today, I'm pleased to announce the top three projects that the committee thought best embodied the spirit of the award. And I'm going to start with Jean Reed from Petaluma. And Jean, oops, oh, let me do this. I forgot to say this. I've got to turn it. Um, so these are the projects, the nine submissions. And as I said, you can find them on the website. But I'm going to turn it over to Jean now, who's going to tell us about the Petaluma project titled Title IX at 50. You need it as much as ever. So the first slide. June 23rd of this year will mark the 50th anniversary of the signing of Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 which, as you know, prohibits, prohibits sex discrimination in any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Title IX has been included in the AAUW public policy priorities for the past 50 years and more. So when leaders of AAUW Petaluma set out last summer to plan for the coming year, we knew that we wanted to commemorate this landmark through our programming. By scheduling an event early in 2022, we would be preparing to celebrate when the anniversary arrives at mid-year. The image on the screen is the Twitter post that was used to promote the webinar held in January. Title IX at 50, we need it as much as ever. AAUW Petaluma is proud to have received the AAUW Activity of the, of the Year Award for this program. Next slide. Next slide. The webinar was presented as a conversation between three women who are experts in Title IX law and Amy G of the San Francisco Giants. As participants signed into Zoom, they were presented with a kind of quiz of Title IX myths and facts. Amy started the webinar by talking about her personal experience as an athlete growing up in an AAUW family. She then spoke with each of the three women individually. The conversation covered why equity in athletics is important, definitions of sexual harassment and its impact, and current Title IX guidelines and the role of Title IX coordinators. Finally, Amy, Amy brought the group together to clarify and explain the myths and facts from the quiz. To keep our members focused on Title IX, AAUW Petaluma started printing the full 37 word text of Title IX in our newsletter each month with a very short two or three sentence comment about some aspect of the law. For the webinar itself, we planned watch parties, arranging for members to meet in small groups to view the webinar together. Unfortunately, the January COVID surge forced us to cancel the watch parties. However, last month we revived the watch party concept for the Title IX program hosted by the Santa Clara County IBC, resulting as expected in some rich discussions. Since the webinar was presented by Zoom, we were able to reach a wider audience than would have been possible in person. We invited our sister branches to attend the webinar and advertised in the local newspaper and on Facebook. Amy G posted her, to her Twitter followers and our guests shared the link with their organization. 56 people attended the live webinar. Since then, another 300 views of the recording have been logged. Next slide. The conversation raised several areas for action. Amy noted that Title IX information needs to be where students can find it easily. Kim emphasized that Title IX must be local to work. Maha talked about the impacts of sexual harassment that follow survivors through their lifetime, impacting finances, mental and physical health and retirement resources. 
Elizabeth reminded us to be sensitive to the needs of trans students who are few and vulnerable and who may not trust that administrators will support them. They all advised us to listen to students and to allow students to tell us what they need. From the beginning, our plan was to be sure that the webinar was followed by actions that would continue to support Title IX up to and beyond the anniversary. Energized by the webinar, a new branch section was formed, which we are calling the Title Niners. Since January, the group has contacted all 32 of our local schools. Next week, we will publish a directory of Title IX coordinators to encourage collaboration between schools. We're meeting monthly to write postcards to our legislators to support Title IX related bills and other legislation impacting women's rights. Our college university liaisons are working with administrators to get us access once students again are on campus. And we have started attending women's sporting events together. We have a solid group of committed members and expect the Title IX to continue as a branch section well into the future. We're meeting next week to plan the June event to honor the Title IX anniversary. Next slide. I'd like to recognize the women who joined our webinar conversation. All of them were eager and enthusiastic about working with us. They donated their time and expertise and as noted brought depth to the discussion. We owe thanks to them for making this webinar a success. We hope that recognition of our branch program will inspire other branches to take action to support Title IX. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Okay, and on to our second award, which goes to Sue Sutton and Sandy Martinez from the La Mesa El Cajon branch. And Sue will be our speaker today. And the, in addition to receiving the award, they also get the award for the longest title. So it's women who protect and serve the challenges of working in predominantly male professions. So Sue, take it away. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, you already gave the title, so I guess I don't need to repeat it again. But um, we were hoping that this would be the first of somewhat of a series of programs over the next two to three years where we feature women in the workforce within our community. So yes, this was our first one, Women Who Protect and Serve. And our mission was to educate and to investigate the workplace and the economic equity within that workplace. We wanted to know what are the barriers that they face? What are the biases that were prevalent? And um, how do they deal with them? What type of support systems were in place as well? So our challenge for our November 2021 meeting was to provide a panel discussion with first responders in our community. We did meet in person and we are fortunate enough that we, we meet in a, uh, a church community room where we were all masked, but um, it was very much appreciated that we could see the panel in person. So locating the speakers was accomplished First of all, through phone calls, we started that late August. And um, we also did a lot of follow-up emails to make sure that all the timings and all the ladies were available. Our biggest challenge was locating a female firefighter within our own community. We are the La Mesa El Cajon branch, and we are east of San Diego. Although we are part of San Diego County, we call ourselves East County. So trying to find a female firefighter was difficult as we only have one in the whole East County of San Diego. And unfortunately she had a prior commitment. So we put in a call to the firefighters union and they provided a speaker for us. We had, an artic we had articles in newspapers. We publicized this on Facebook and at our website. And from this program, we had one of the reporters who actually came to the meeting and then featured our branch in a follow-up article. And so that was an extra for us and we really appreciated that. Questions were prepared and, and given to the speakers in advance. We didn't want anyone to be blindsided. And my co-chair, Sandy Martinez, acted as facilitator and presented the questions on the day of the event. So let me highlight the questions for you. These were asked of the, the panel. 
For the panelists in non-traditional jobs, what are the challenges in your field? Secondly, for the dispatchers, you are seeing more men entering your field. How has that changed your work environment? Thirdly, do you feel that you have support systems in place to support women in the profession? And is pay equity an issue in your agency? We had some additional questions, but those are the four I wanted to highlight for you. We learned several things from our speakers. One of the things we learned is that pay equity was actually not an issue because they're on a pay scale and all genders are paid the same. The second thing that we learned was that firefighter equipment is not designed for the female body. It's designed for the male body. So quite often the females are in kind of a dangerous situation where their equipment is not fitting them correctly for whatever they're needing to do. This is an issue that we hope to uh, expand on this next year and uh, pursue more thoroughly. To add a bit of levity to the meeting, we provided a photo opportunity where people could come up and have a mug shot. The first responders loved this and they were the first in line to get their pictures taken. Uh, we also provided a staff emergency treat pack, which you can see a picture of there with candy goodies for everyone who was in attendance. And uh, in case you can't see it very well, the emergency treat pack had things like Tootsie Rolls to help you to roll with the punches or Starburst for a burst of energy when you need it. And then lifesavers to remind each and every one of them that they are one. Um, you might also notice in the picture that Declan, the facility dog attended. Obviously, he stole the show. Our participants re represented the La Mesa Police Department, San Diego firefighters, the US Border Patrol, and a mother-daughter duo of the San Diego dispatchers. The mother had also served in the Air Force, and her daughter actually began as an EMT. So we had a lot of different perspectives that was coming to this panel. We were very fortunate that our panelists were very personable and extremely entertaining. And as luck would have it, the three officers were all named Katie. So that added quite a bit of uh, extra humor. They referred to themselves as Police Katie, Fire Katie, and Federal Katie. The program was in a direct response to our goals for the year, which included continued research into Title IX issues, gender equity, and community outreach. Education of our membership is an ongoing focus at our meetings. And unfortunately, since we had no control over with who the agencies were sending, we were not able to have diversity on our panel. We were just excited to have people on our panel. This program proved to be one of the highlights of the year and it helped us to sustain our attendance throughout the year. I believe we had 56 folks in attendance at this particular program. Um, it was a wonderful thing for us to put together. Folks loved it. And if anyone has any questions, put them in the chat or send them to us at the La Mesa El Cajon branch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. That was an amazing presentation, and I love the mugshot. Um, I think that would be really cute if we had all of our branch members do a mugshot. All right, so now let's turn to um, Mountain View, Los Altos Mountain View, and Claire Noonan, who's going to share with us the project that they did called Step Up for Pro Choice. Claire. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, excuse me, next slide. Next slide, please. Somehow we missed one, but anyway, hello, uh, member, AUW members and guests. 
our virtual event titled Step Up for Pro-Choice took place January 22nd, 2022, the 49th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision called Roe v. Wade. Um, you're, you're still not at the slides that I wanted to show. Can you go up one more? This is the first slide, Step Up for Pro-Choice. But the next slide, please. Well, I don't know. Anyway, here's the slide I wanted now. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Self-determination and reproductive health is one of the key social justice priorities of AUW. So since 1985, our branch has observed the anniversary of Roe v. Wade with speakers and public demonstrations of support. Next, please. Uh, we dis we distributed, distributed a flyer in December as heads up to other branches for inclusion in their newsletters. Next, please. Yes. Uh, we are fortunate that our local newspaper supports all of our activities. This pre-publicity ran early in January, written by member Allison Johnson. Next, please. We used a variety of media to get the word out. So this ad appeared a, a week or so before the event in our local newspaper. Next, please. Evite was, of course, our most useful tool to register branch members and other past guests. Next. Uh, member Nancy Bromo set up our Facebook page and dual member Sandy Hansen set up our website homepage, not available to share with you as it has been changed now. Next, please. We used Eventbrite and Nextdoor as outreach to the general community members. And uh, Zoom, as, in the, as the other people have said, allowed us to host top flight speakers from remote locations. They included Christine Krasinski from NARAL, Professor Leslie J. Regan, a specialist in the history of American medicine, who has also written two books about abortion history, and our state senator, Josh, Josh Becker, who spoke about proposed California legislation to support women seeking reproductive choice in California. Next. And to engage the audience, we asked them in advance to prepare a sign in support of choice and to hold it up at the end of the meeting for a screenshot. Next. At the end of the program, Los Altos Stage Company performed a scene, a scene from the play Row on YouTube. And the play was scheduled and streamed in March 2020, 2022 for the community and anybody who had been to this uh, event and wanted to see it. Next, please. A good follow up appeared in the local newspaper. Next, please. We sent non-member attendees information about AEOW with an invitation to membership. This isn't the whole letter, but some of it. Next, please. And we sent all at attendees copies of the screenshot, as well as a list of resources regarding pro-choice for a call to action. Uh, considering the news of events about abortion and contraceptive regulations in other states since January 2020, since January 22nd, we may all want to keep in mind Senator Becker's quote by Coretta Scott King, struggle is never ending, an ending, an ending process. Uh, so 
reproductive choice is too valuable for any of us to give up. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. I uh, really appreciate it. appreciate all of the branches that submitted their um, uh, programs. It was a difficult decision, um, but we had to uh, narrow it down and we just really appreciate all of the effort that's gone on. And I hope that other branches and these branches will consider um, applying next year for the um, third year of uh, Branch Activity of the Year Awards. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Get my video to go on. Thank you very much. That was, that's very good. I, I love this program, by the way. I think it, it just showcases the creativity and the dedication that our branch members have. It's really, really wonderful. So I suspect that next year you'll have more than nine. You'll probably have 15 or something like that. So anyway, it's a great program. And the third year will again, be great. So thank you all for submitting your uh, entry into this. And now we're going to move to Sharman Gearing, who's going to talk to us about an election that we're going to have, right? Uh, we're talking about an election we're in the middle of right now. <laughs> anyway, thank you. I wanted to um, just, first of all, I want to really thank um, all of you who have stepped up to run for office. I think the next slide should show everybody. Um, when my committee and I got together at the beginning of the year, back in August or September, we thought we had a daunting task. We had to find seven director candidates and one secretary candidate. And as you can see, we actually have an overflow. We have a contested election, which is amazing. And so my committee was, I wanna really thank Deanna Arthur, Jane Niemeyer and Carolyn Garfine, who were wonderful in helping write B2B articles and making calls and emailing branches and just really trying to find um, women who would like to step up into leadership. And what's wonderful about this panel here of all these women is several of them have not been on the state board before. And so it's wonderful to get some new leaders um, coming up to the state level and working on this board. So I wanna thank you all. Um, everyone should have received your ballot in the e uh, email with your ballot. Um, April 23rd, and it does end May 15th. So if you haven't voted yet, please do you have time. I think that I heard that we had almost 100 people had uh, voted within the first couple hours of receiving the email. So that's fantastic. Um, if you have not received that or you can't find the email, check your um, spam folder. It could be in there. And then um, if you had a mail-in ballot, it must be received back in the office by May 15th in order to be counted. So we'll look forward to announcing around May 17th. Um, who the winners were, who the new directors will be, and having a, a new slate of office or a new board going forward. So thank you so much to everyone and um, continue thinking about in the future serving on our state board. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Sharman. And just stay on because you are going to introduce our next keynote speaker. So this should be really, really good. So thank you for you know, talking to Jasmine and getting her permission and getting her excited about speaking to AUW. So would you please introduce Jasmine? I will, it's my pleasure. So Jasmine has two, directed me to her website for her bio. She has two different bios. One is a youth bio and one was a traditional bio. I'm going with the youth bio today. So here's her bio. The hashtag dancing rocket scientist. Originally from Detroit, a classically trained ballet dancer and aerospace engineer, that's Ms. Jasmine L. Sadler, MBA. Her knowledge helped her turn air into energy in her career as a quality manager in software design, turbine test, and quality engineer in San Diego, California. She combines her love of dance and art with her love for STEM as the CEO plus visionary of the STEAM Collaborative, which increases the number of diverse children of all ages and cultures pursuing science, technology, engineering, and math alongside artistic endeavors. She works with informal education, youth organizations to design, implement, and manage STEAM programming. She takes her ballet dancing to schools and then explains how physics and math can solve problems. Just so cool. Welcome, Jasmine. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, um, having me back, I'll say, because I definitely attended 
a chapter AAUW meeting and spoke about just being an engineer. Uh, while I was still an engineer, I worked as an engineer for 10 years. And so here's my intro slide. Let's get into it here. I'll uh, put a couple of links in the chat so you all can reach out to me and then you can feel free to drop some questions in the chat and I'll save some time at the end to answer any of those that pop up. Whenever you feel something, just go ahead and type it in. So again, my name is Jasmine Sadler. I am an aerospace engineer. I went to college for that, went to University of Michigan, studied for four years and also got a math minor. But I also love dancing just as much as I love engineering. And so my favorite type of dance is ballet. I'm a ballerina and I'm also an entrepreneur, also known as a business leader, or someone who has their own business, and my company is called the STEAM Collaborative, and I'm also an activist, especially for women, girls, and people of color, so people who are traditionally underrepresented in STEM fields, and again, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math, but I always add the arts in because that's who I am, and so I use the acronym STEAM a lot. So here's some photos of me dancing, doing some business type things, but then the bottom left picture is me at work as an engineer. The middle one is a program I did with some girls. And then I also have a full size statue of me. And that was part of an, an initiative called the If Then Initiative. And I was an ambassador for that with 125 women around the country to make science more cool and especially for girls. So really excited for that. Next slide, please. So when researching more on AAUW, because I'm already affiliated, but I just wanted to see what's out there, especially because now I'm in school for my doctorate in education and educational leadership. So doing a lot of research and finding articles about just what's out there. And so AAUW has actually published one with Dell around the playbook on best practices, talking about gender equity in tech. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And so I'll either say STEM or tech or engineering, um, kind of not all the same thing, but I may kind of uh, go back and forth between some of those. So next slide, please. So what does diversity look like? Can you all type in the chat anything that stands out to you in this photo? I'm still checking out the chat too. Uh, Jasmine, they can just chat mostly with me, oh, okay. sorry. Okay, so <laughs> let, me, let me turn it on. I can turn it on for oh, everybody okay. right now for this session, so go so ahead. <laughs> sure. I've already seen a few direct messages from people. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. One woman only. I see Linda says, um, mostly all older white men. Yes. All men. Yes. Yep. And so I'm the only woman in the picture. <laughs> uh, this was my team, my engineering team. Uh, so the thing is, I was one of only four engineers in this picture. And so uh, the rest of the people in the picture are, are quality test technicians. But uh, Basically, you know, it's a difference between a car mechanic and then an automotive or mechanical engineer. And so, of course, as an engineer, you get paid more, but you also go to school for that to study a lot more, um, you know, a lot, a lot more complicated math and hard sciences. But, you know, my whole team probably knew a lot more than me because as you can see, they're about double my age. Some of them had children that were older than me. So it was, um, I had to learn a lot from, from them as well. So yes, I see people more comments. So yes, 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 yes. Uh, were they respectful towards me and gave me opportunities? Yes, my team was actually pretty respectful towards me. Um, so it was it was always really interesting for me as a woman in that space that um, I had to try to dress up a little more. But you know, when we're working in this test cell, this is when I was a test engineer. One of our engines is behind us. Um, I had to wear steel toe shoes, safety glasses, earplugs every day. No dresses, full length pants, and so you know. For me, I'm just like, okay, well, I love wearing skirts and long earrings and different things that I couldn't really wear at work. So 
um, it wasn't about necessarily my team respecting me as much. Um, they, they were amazing at that, but, you know, I was young and, um, and, you know, I just had to try my best to distinguish myself as an engineer, as the authority in the room, especially when we had customers come in and ask us questions about the engine. I was the one to answer those. So, um, yeah, I'll keep going. Next slide, please. So from the playbook of best practices, one of the topics that they talk about is support and inclusive talent pipeline. And so, you know, that's really why I'm here today. Why I do what I do is to get more women and girls into engineering if possible, if you're interested. And even if you don't know that you're interested, you might be. And so, um, but that's really what that inclusive talent pipeline is all about is how do you intertwine some of the things that we may love to do as girls that are actually engineering. And so uh, for me, I was a baker very young. My mom let me use the, the oven at home when I was really young. And, uh, but then understanding that that's chemistry. So being able to measure different things out, um, but then chemical engineers are all about solving problems with chemistry. So that's really the difference between a scientist and an engineer. An engineer is all about problem solving. And so we use science to solve those problems. We use math to solve those problems. But you know, helping girls especially understand that what we're already doing, the way our minds already think, is solving problems every day. And so that is engineering. You just have to figure out kind of which science to latch that onto to make it engineering. So next slide, please. So here's a little bit about my path. Um, so starting at the top in the 12 o'clock position, um, that's algebra. That's when I first realized I love math. And I know some people are shaking their heads out there, but I really do love math. And I realized that in eighth grade, when I was in algebra and my teacher is teaching us some different topics and I'm not understanding it the way they're teaching it, but I'm still getting the same answer. So then I started turning around to my classmates in class and telling them like how I understood it. And of course, teachers don't like you talking in class, but that's what I did and my classmates understood it. And so that's when I realized I love math and I love helping people love math too. And so from there, you kind of go on to calculus, which is a really cool thing. It's not as difficult as some may think. It's all about um, geometry really so like the shape of things so um, the area under a curve and different things like that which isn't too complicated especially when you need it to solve some problems so I went to the University of Michigan where I studied for four years for a degree in aerospace engineering while there I studied abroad in Hong Kong at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology my classes were taught in English I took some math classes in English in Hong Kong, but also studied or also traveled all around Southeast Asia to Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, uh, Korea, lots of different places out there. Um, and that was a wonderful experience. And so from there, I mean, I, I had several internships while I was in school for my undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering. And so uh, one of them was designing aircraft engines. Another one was helping to design those big white wind turbines that you may see in the airfields. Um, then also did some work with drones for the military. And so uh, that's what that helicopter picture is. It's pretty much a full-size helicopter, but there's no people in it. So it's an autonomous aerial vehicle. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, you press a button, it goes out and you've already programmed it in the software what it should do. You've already coded it in what it should do. So it does that thing, it comes back and lands safely. Um, so that was part of my internship experience. So just for the summer, worked on things like that. But then most of my career was in turning air into energy. So that I, I never wanted to be an astronaut, never wanted to be a pilot, but wanted to make those people's lives better and safer because people shouldn't be dying doing such a really cool job. And that's what it's all about for aircraft engine quality, especially is to make sure if something keeps failing on that engine, making sure that the people can land safely and that that thing doesn't keep happening over and over again. So that's what I did as an engineer. So I solved that problem and helped 
with my team, we all helped to solve those problems. Um, and then from there, I mean, I, I knew pretty early on while I was working as an engineer that I wouldn't be there to retire after 30 years because I knew that there was something else in me and I just couldn't figure it out exactly. But in 2014, I ended up starting my company. And at that time it was called Adorn the World because I just wanted to help people learn math better. So it was really just a math tutoring company. I'm not gonna say just a math tutoring. It was a math tutoring company. I didn't have any clients for a while, but then I actually uh, got more connected with the adults that were around me. So I was in my twenties and there were some people that I knew, especially at my church who wanted to get a degree in engineering. And they were about 50 years old, but still needed to go to community college and pass pre-calculus and calculus. So I started tutoring adults twice my age in math. And so that's kind of how this, the company started. But then when teachers found out that I was an aerospace engineer, they asked me, can you just come in my classroom and sit in the corner and we can point to you and say, she's a rocket scientist and you can be one too. So I kind of started doing some of that, but other hands-on workshops as well. Um, and then from there, uh, business started growing more. I went back to school at Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego and got my master's in business administration. So I was working full-time as an engineer, going to school in the evenings full-time for two years and growing my company all at the same time. So I was part of the Global Social Innovation Challenge, which was the first thing I did um, to raise money for my company and got together these business leaders and people who were leaders in STEM education. Um, so I got all of them in the same room and a lot of them had nonprofit organizations who um, really just do hands-on experiments and, and help children love STEM a lot more. So, but I started growing from there and instead of me creating another STEM camp or another after-school program, I now help those leaders come together and collaborate in the STEAM Collaborative. And then I help them just do it better and more efficiently. And if there's something that keeps failing, help them solve that problem. So exactly what I did as a quality engineer, I'm still doing that engineering work, but I'm doing it in education instead. I'm also a member at Hera Hub. It's a co-working space for women in San Diego, a lovely place to be around a lot of other women who started their businesses and are still, you know, still trying to figure it out together. A lot of us are first generation business owners. We didn't have parents who started their own company to, to teach us those, those skills. So, you know, that's why I went back and got my master's in business administration. But then that's also why I continue to be around mentors and people who think creatively. So next slide, please. Okay, and then so this is really just to show that I've had a diverse education, diverse career, and I'm a diverse entrepreneur as well. And so I am diversity and it's not because I'm black or a girl or a woman, it's because I've had so many different experiences in life and all of that kind of comes together into something that makes me diverse and makes me stand out. And so I'm sure everybody out there has lived experiences, things that you've gone through in life, good or bad things that you've gone through. And at some point, I promise you, it'll all make sense why you went through all of these things and that's really the passion that lives inside of you and exactly what you should be doing. Next slide, please. So back to the play, playbook on best practices, it also talks about build equity into your recruiting DNA. And so I definitely wanna encourage AAUW to do this. And you know, just when we think about who we're inviting to the table when we're thinking about who we sent this Zoom link out to or the invitation to attend today, that you build that equity into your recruiting DNA because you have to consider people that may not be on the Zoom call um, if you want to bring them in. And so usually everybody on the Zoom call already has the link, has the technology, has been here before, but people who haven't been invited before, you have to consider why they haven't been before. Is it because they don't have access, either internet or never got an invitation, or because you know they just don't know that wonderful programs like this are even going on. So when you build that equity 
into your recruiting DNA, even for membership, even for your jobs, even for friends and mentors that you'll have in your life. You think about who's not included in my circle and how can I actually invite those people in? What would they like to see so that I can invite them in as well? Next slide, please. And so this is kind of my master plan on one slide. So my plan is to own and run a STEAM university. So again, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math that develops leaders. And so that includes adults as well as children being able to learn together. Um, and so right now I'm pursuing a doctorate in education and educational leadership at University of California, San Diego, and Cal State San Marcos is a joint program between the two universities. And so I'm hoping to combine STEAM education, cultural competence, including like that equity perspective, and then operational effectiveness. So making sure that things are streamlined, that they're running well, that there's no uh, just breaks in, in people's creative thinking. So making sure that everything is easy to use for everyone that'll be in the university. And so right now, again, I mostly work in designing, implementing, and managing STEAM programs for informal education leaders. So nonprofit organizations who are really just trying to do the good work, but a lot of them are still full-time engineers. So they started a, a nonprofit organization as a side hobby and made it an official company or made it an official nonprofit, but still work full time. So I come in and help them get it to where it needs to be so that they can keep getting more grant funding and keep growing and, and serving more people. And so instead of me doing a camp for 20 kids, now I can do this STEAM Leader Summit, which is a picture is in the top left, where I brought together about 30 uh, STEAM leaders. And if each of them has 30 children in their program, then that's 30 times 30. So now I'm affecting 900 children instead of just 30 in one classroom setting. So um, that's really my big master plan. And um, hopefully, you know, there'll be an opportunity for you all to come alongside with everything that I'm doing, because, you know, as university women, this will also be a university, and I'm excited to share all of this with you all. So next slide, please. And again, back to the playbook, the last thing on there is to create and sustain a winning culture for all, and that's ultimately what my plan is, that it's a winning culture that everyone feels included, that even though the organizations, the, the chapters just got those chapter awards that that's embedded into what we do as programming across all of AAUW and across every organization ideally, but across all of AAUW that it's a winning culture for all that when one organization wins that award, then we can spread that through all of the other organizations as well. And so that's ultimately what I'm trying to do is creating this university, building these STEM programs so that they expand and more children can pursue STEM if they choose to, but that they actually just learn more about how STEM impacts our everyday life. Next slide, please. Yep, so this is my last slide. And then again, please put your comments in the chat, your questions in the chat. But here, I just want to thank you all. I also came out with a book earlier this year, which I threw in the chat as well. So it's uh, my, I, my labor of love is called Balancing Your Own Center of Gravity, a manual for hyperproductive STEM professionals. Um, it's on Amazon. And I've also created a STEM Pals, which is like a pen pal, virtual pen pal uh, connection between girls and women who are both uh, interested in STEM in some type, some type of way. So thank you all for having me. I will definitely entertain questions. Um, let's see, I, I see one here. What's the first question you ask when an organization is having a problem? That's a really good question. So talking about operations and failure and reliability and making sure that things are streamlined. Uh, so when an organization is having a problem, one of the first things I ask is, 
what do you need right now? Because that's a really tough question sometimes, but for all of us, we should always have in mind, if anybody asks us, what do you need right now? That you always have an answer. Of course, like people will throw off, I need a million dollars. But then in the business world, I'd ask you, what would you do with that million dollars? How would you allocate that? What would that go to? Um, and so to just ask for a million dollars when you may not really need a million dollars, um, there may be something you actually need right now that could be more concrete. So that's that's what I ask is, what do you need right now? And then I also ask, what is your long-term vision? Because sometimes we get caught up in doing certain things right now that don't really go towards the long-term vision. And I, I found myself doing that as well, even right before COVID happened, I was an educator at an alternative all girls high school. So these were girls that were failing out of their high school, but we just wanted to help them like math a little bit. And so that's what I was doing, but you know, it was fulfilling. It was amazing. Those seven girls were, were beautiful. And they actually started to like math because they saw that it could solve some of the problems that they were going through at, in their home life. And so it was, um, so those, those are some things It's just like, what's your ultimate goal? For me, I was kind of going really micro level or very small into um, each individual girl that I was working with. But then I had to start going back to the macro level. So the larger scale view of how could I make all of these girls' lives better and even more girls that I may never meet. And so that's part of what the book is about uh, for my mentees, my mentees that I'll never meet, people who are hyperproductive like me, who do everything and then go to class after and then go back to work and then start your own companies. So it's, um, so yeah, so that, those are some of the questions that I asked. Let's see what else is in here. I see a comment saying she loves math too. Her her daughter is multicultural and multiracial. She's half black. She loves baking too. And she is an engineering specialist in the military. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Um, and this is a really good point because she talked so many great things about her daughter, but then there's so many great things about us as parents as well when we support our children to, to do those things. And so for me, my parents, were always amazing and encouraged me to do whatever I wanted to do. One thing I wanted to do was bake. Another thing I wanted to do was play softball. Another thing I wanted to do was learn how to play golf. <laughs> and so um, those are things that my parents encouraged me to do. The main thing that stuck for me was dance, which I loved so much, but um, help a lot. my parents allowing me to be creative and you know help me to do whatever great idea I had then that's when, um, you know, that that's really what changed my life more than anything. And so that's what I'm studying in my doctorate program is the adults that influence these children, that influence these girls to pursue STEM. It's, it's really when you find that, that spark or that connection, find a way that it connects to a STEM field. And I'm sure most girls will, will at least listen for a little bit longer. Let's see what else is in here. All righty, I think that may be it. Oh, someone asked, was the University of Michigan a good choice for me? Uh, this, the, this will be my last question. Um, yeah, another part of that question was who inspired me to follow this path? So both of my parents, I'm, I'm privileged that both of my parents were computer specialists for, for the government but they never really brought that stuff home with them. They never, I never knew what they did at work. I still don't know what they did at work. I don't think they could actually tell me what they did at work. But again, it was more so that they were encouraging and like found a connection and found a STEM program to put me in when I was growing up. So they inspired me. And then my older brother, he's four years older than me, actually studied computer engineering right before me. Um, and so, he said, you should really consider engineering because you're really good in math and science like I am. But then I, I wasn't the most fond of computers and coding and uh, all of that kind of stuff. So 
I ended up studying aerospace because there was a space shuttle disaster when I was in high school and I had to choose a major and I studied aerospace because again, I didn't want people dying, doing such a cool job, doing, you know, the most cool job that's out of this world, you know, and so that's why I wanted to help them with safety, help them with quality, make sure that they return safely back home. And so the University of Michigan was a great choice for me. I was local to home. I'm originally from Detroit, so it was about 40 minutes from home. Um, there were some scholarships that, that were really great <laughs> for if, uh, if you were in the state of Michigan. And I mean, it's a huge top 10 university, but then I also really enjoyed Point Loma Nazarene University, which is a very small nonprofit Christian university and the intimacy that that brings. And then currently in my program, it's a cohort model as well. There's only 18 people in my class. And so I love that as well. So that's why, you know, starting this university, all of that plays into how I plan to design my university is the different universities that I've attended. So again, I want to thank you all for having me back once again, and I'll stick around and maybe respond to some of these other questions in the chat if that's okay, but thank you again for having me. Okay. Well, thank you, Jasmine. I love your enthusiasm and your passion for what you're doing. That really comes through. So thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. And for and we're going to keep in touch because you have some qualities that would be really good for our tech trick girls. So thank you very much for coming. And we'll stay in touch. Wow. Okay. So now we're going to move on to how about speech track video number three. So Marlene. Thank you, Diane. Yes, I hope you're all enjoying our public speaking adventure. This is uh, speech track video number three from Del Mar Lucadia branch. This is Sanjana Kumar. The distinct silhouette of the Statue of Liberty stands tall in the upper bay of New York City. She holds her torch high up towards the sky representing freedom, opportunity, and refuge. There is an inscription on the base of the statue of Our Lady Liberty. It is a poem by Emma Lazarus and it reads, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. These poetic lines seem to embody the very fundamental ideas of Americanness, the idea that our shores are open the idea that we are a great melting pot welcoming all. What you might not know about the Statue of Liberty, however, is that there are shackles at her feet. There is a chain that winds around her right foot and goes off to her left before breaking. And these broken shackles are there because the original Statue of Liberty was originally created to celebrate abolition, to celebrate the fact that African Americans could no longer be legally enslaved in the United States. The reason she is not a symbol of abolition in modern day, however, is because the citizens of the United States of America were too ashamed to have a symbol shining in New York Harbor reminding all of the mistakes that had been made. But ignoring the darkness of our past only invites it to cloud our future. So rather than follow the example of the Lady of Liberty, changing our message, our narrative to ignore our past, Today, I instead want to firstly talk about how the United States has failed to uphold its pledge of liberty and justice for all, and then talk about why, where this has begun and what the root of this issue is, and thirdly, focus on how we are able to fix it. So firstly, how have we failed in this pledge? Well, the speakers before me have so eloquently articulated it, but allow me to extend. We pledge in the Pledge of Allegiance to make a country that has liberty and justice for all. But liberty, as an Abed piece from 2015 said, has been reduced to a license for self-centeredness. And justice has been diminished to mere re retaliatory action. Dictionaries define liberty as the state of being free, diminish liberty to mere action taken in vengeance. But it is so much more than that. The heritage of the liberty and justice that we seek for in our country is about creating a level playing field, a level foundation upon which we can build a better society. But that playing field can't be level when white women make 70 cents to a man's dollar and Hispanic women make 30 cents to a man's dollar. 
it can't be level when there is anti-Asian American hate crimes that extend back to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 or Angel Island. It can't be a level playing field when in 40 states, the gay panic defense still exists, a defense against hate crimes of gay or transgender individuals. It can't be a level playing field because we haven't made enough progress to get there yet. And here's where you may be thinking, but we have made so much progress, we have come so far. And you're right, we have. But for every two steps we take forward, we take one step back. Let's take the example of anti-African hate in our country. We passed the Emancipation Proclamation, so slavery was no longer legal. A success, right? But then came the Jim Crow laws, laws that severely restricted rights of, of African-American individuals. We repealed the Jim Crow laws with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and then boom, along came redlining restricting the income that was available to African-American individuals. After redlining was fixed with the Fair Housing Act came the mass incarceration of modern day, along with police brutality that has resulted in egregious crimes against African-American citizens. So what we can see here is that for every win, there is a loss, meaning that something must be done to break the cycle. So we know that we have not been upholding this pledge, but why is that? We are a nation, after all, full of bright minds working towards a brighter future. Why haven't we, be, we been able to achieve liberty and justice for all? Well, in essence, it's about implicit bias. Sure, for example, the Chinese Exclusion Acts were repealed, but that doesn't mean there isn't anti-Asian crime in the status quo. Because with every generation, they are taught the history of years past, but not how to solve for it. So implicit biases against racial groups, against women, against gay and transgender populations, against every minority are perpetuated generation to generation. The only place that we can solve it is in the youth because they are the ones that can truly solve the issue. That brings me to solution. It is a common idiom among political speeches that the youth of today are the leaders of tomorrow. Solving this issue starts in classrooms. We will be able to break this cycle by programs targeting how to be anti-racist, how to be proactive citizens of society, because once children understand that, they can go forth to teach it to future generations. If we truly believe that the youth of today are leaders of tomorrow, we should start empowering them to truly be leaders of tomorrow. The Statue of Liberty is an example of where we have attempted to push past egregious history by focusing on light that shines through the cracks of our nation. But allow me instead to point you to a new light. Every student in every classroom in America. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjana. That was great. Okay, we've got some great speakers here, Marley, and I wonder who's going to come out number one, number two, number three. Wow. And now it's time to get back to our adventures. Come back everybody from your great adventure. Okay. So I hope it was a successful session for you. And now we're gonna go back to Marlene Kane who has some exciting news to share with us. So Marlene. Thank you, Diane. Well, before I share that exciting news, just a quick uh, few thank yous. I really want to acknowledge our judges, both for the finals and for the semifinals. You may see that the judges were pulled from a variety of fields, education and government, nonprofit, entrepreneurial ship as well. And I just want to give a special shout out to, to both the finals and the next slide as well, the semifinals. Um, these judges perform a thankless task, although I thank them profusely, but truly a thankless task. And I just want to thank them publicly, both on this presentation and in upcoming articles for their thoughtfulness and their time and their expertise. And uh, they'll be hearing more from me as we, as we go on. But thank you very much. Um, I also, I don't have a slide for this, but I also want to make sure I thank our Speech Trek committee, uh, a very dynamic committee uh, composed of Kathy Foxhoven, Lana Widman, who hosted a, a adventure session today, and Judy Steele, our Speech Trek treasurer. Um, I had us off to this committee for their constant input and uh, dedication to improving communication. So thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. 
And let's see the next slide, please. We'll have those semifinals judges, I believe. And let's, call, let's hold it there just, just for a moment so I can announce the winners before we go on to our last topic. So I'm gonna start from third place and I wanna thank you all for your patience, especially our contestants who've been waiting for a couple of weeks to find out how they place. So I will start with third place. Uh, please uh, allow me to congratulate from Del Mar Lucadia branch, Sanjana Kumar, who placed third and wins a cash award of $500. So congratulations, Sanjana, well done. Uh, our second place winner hails from Fremont branch, Rhea Jane, and a cash award of $1,000. Congratulations to Fremont Branch and to Rhea Jane. Also a well done and very, uh, both very exciting speeches for us to see today. And our first place winner from Poway Penasquitos Branch, Christine Sai, who will be awarded $1,500. That's $1,500 cash award. Uh, congratulations, Christine and the Poway Penasquitos Branch. Um, I believe this is the second state winner for Poway Penasquitos in less than five years. So um, thank you for setting that pace, uh, Poway Penasquitos, and congratulations, Christine Sai, as our first place winner. Before we get to our next uh, slide, our last slide, I just want to let you know if you feel that you want to foster um, communication in ways that will move people, like Lisa Matt said this morning. Um, if you're looking for a way to advocate in challenging times, as Lisa said, uh, to support reasonable discourse, if you want to strive like Jackie Spire said, if you want to strive to do what you think you cannot do, or what Gloria Blackwell was in indicating, if you want to advocate for voting rights and really speak out, I have the answer for you and every branch that's listening. The answer is host a speech trek. It's a low cost, high touch program that touches on all those issues. And of course it shines a light on your branch and it empowers the next generation uh, by giving them a voice and uh, hopefully giving you some new members. So that's my commercial, my pitch for speech trip. If you do believe in advocating rights, you're gonna like our 2023 topic, voting rights. It's taken directly from our public policy priorities. Next slide, please. So our public policy priority is to guarantee equality, individual rights, and social justice for a diverse and inclusive society. And that's why at AAUW California advocates protection and expansion of voting rights. So, you know, when the President Johnson first uh, called upon Congress to create the Voting Rights Act of 1965, he said in our system, the first and most vital of all our rights is the right to vote. So that is uh, becomes uh, the impetus for our question for 2023. And the question is, how can communities, organizations, and citizens of all ages help protect and expand voting rights? That is the question for our next speech trek. The materials for 2023 speech trek are in preparation now. They'll be on the website later this spring, early summer. And I encourage all branches to take advantage of that. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Congratulations to our winners. And a big thank you to our, our judges and all the friends of Speech Trek who helped bring this together. And thank you, Marlene, for doing all of that work, you and your committee. It was, really, they were great speeches. I was trying to think how we could get those out to all the branches. To, you know, I know they'll be on our website, so all the branches should be able to watch those. And I think that'd be great. Uh, for study groups or, you know, some of our interest groups or for a general meeting to watch all three of those because they really did a, a really, really, really nice job. So we're just about to the close of our program and it's uh, my honor to thank all the people that helped with this. It, it really took the village to do this. And I would like to especially thank Sandy Gabe for all her work uh, to get this all together. I don't think most people realize how much work this was to put this kind of a program together where we could have adventure land and uh, speeches and videos and all those kinds of things. This, this is really remarkable. And uh, we, we wouldn't have done it without Sandy. Also, I'd like to thank those people behind the scenes. 
uh, that you didn't really see, but they were the ones showing the videos and making sure everybody was in the right places. And that was uh, Julika Barrett Randa Landing and Linda Slater. So thank you all for being behind the scenes. Nobody really saw you probably most of the time. And we appreciate all the time that you spent. And I also want to thank Sharman, who is our meetings planner, who had a big part in all of this, and Dawn Johnson for their work putting Adventure Land together. That was a lot of work too. Um, not that any of our board members are, uh, they're used to being, you know, doing a lot of work, so they weren't surprised, but this was a lot of work to put this all together. So thank you, Sharman, and thank you, Dawn, for all your work. And I'd also like to thank all of the board members for supporting this. You know, we, we decided a year ago, we were trying to think about whether having an in-person meeting or whether we should meet virtually. And I think I told you this before, we decided to meet virtually. So, um, so anyway, all of the board of directors and the leadership team supported this. And I, I really appreciated that. So thank you all for doing a great job the last two years. And, and putting your heart into this because AUW is a wonderful organization and it shows when everybody pulls together and pulls off a program like this. So now uh, this will be my last chance to say thank you to all of our members for giving me the opportunity to be the president of AUW California. And it's my pleasure now to pass the gavel. And we're going to see how this works virtually, okay? Oh, I think awesome. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Are you going left or right? <laughs> well, you're actually below me right now. So I think oh, I'll have to oh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I, see it. I see it coming. Hit her on the head with it. But anyway, <laughs> I would like to congratulate you, Sandy, for taking over as president of California AUW. And here's your gavel to call everybody to order here, right here. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, <laughs> you know what? I forgot to turn off my blur. <laughs> so uh, could you could you see it? Because you so my blur is off. Did you turn mine off? No. I didn't turn yours off. It should, let's do it again. Okay, we can do this. I think they went off. I think my blur went off or my uh, California okay. I see it. I see it. Here it comes. Okay, oh, there Here it you is. Go. Okay. okay. Yay. <laughs> this, this would have been easier to do if we'd been in person. But anyway, yes. congratulations, Sandy. And Thank you. best wishes for a great two years. And board members, we're not done yet. We have a meeting tomorrow morning at 930. And we have, we're going to have, you don't know this yet, but we're going to have a meeting in May also because we're not going to be able to do everything. So I'm not done really yet, but pretty soon. Okay, so and thank we're you not, all. We're not quite done with the meeting. Um, I would like to take this opportunity um, to uh, thank Diane. So please join me in thanking Diane for her years of service to AAUW. We recognize her most recent contributions as the AAUW California president. Diane's been an active local branch member and a leader and a participant at the national level. We were fortunate that Diane stepped forward to provide her leadership skills to the organization. I don't think that she could anticipate the challenges that she'd face as the first, perhaps first state president that never met her board or leadership team in person. Despite that, or maybe because of that, she rallied the group to take on new challenges and to continue to provide support and encouragement to AAUW California and encourage us to be bold, brave, and brilliant. You saw the results of that in our animated report this morning. At this time, I'd like to announce that we created the Diane Owens Honorary Fund, which supports the Greatest Need Fund. Diane has been a longtime supporter of AAUW Fund, and it seems fitting to continue her legacy of strong support with the establishment of this fund. And we'll publicize how to contribute the fund in coming days. So thank you, Diane. It's been a great couple of years. Thank you, thank you very much. And luckily um, on Zoom, you can't see the tears that were in face. <laughs> but thank you so much. This means a lot to me because you yeah. know that AUW fund is- I know it's dear, near and dear to your heart. All right, right, right. All right. So, 
Thank you very much, right. very much. And if